What's happening, everybody? Welcome back to another Fall Obsession podcast episode. My name is Sam Thrash. I'm your host over here at Fall Obsession Podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. This week, my guest is a gentleman named Brett Roselle. He is known as the Backcountry Bowhunter. That's where you can find him on social media and everything. But his latest bow hunting experience is one for the record books for sure. He went to Russia on a brown bear hunt. He has never hunted bear before in his life, and a brown bear was number one on the bucket list. He looked into the Alaska hunts and everything like that, ended up switching gears, and there's a whole story that he tells that goes with all this, but ended up switching gears and going to Russia to pursue his number one bucket list dream of killing a big brown bear and pulled it off of course so incredible story very inspiring very passionate gentleman um, passionate about hunting in the outdoors and i was inspired for sure by this conversation that i have with him and getting to hear about this incredible adventure and experience that he just had so hope you guys enjoy this episode before we get there though Fall Obsession Podcast is brought to you guys in partnership with Hoot Camo. First experience I had rocking Hoot gear was actually in eastern Colorado on our flatland deer country hunt. Really love the patterns. The gear holds up phenomenally. Very durable, very versatile, very warm in cold weather. That's important. So if you guys are looking to get into some high quality outdoor gear, I recommend that you guys go check out Hoot Camo. And even if you don't pick up any actual hunting gear right now, if you just want to pick up some of their fishing wear for the summer or everyday casual wear, you can use the code FALLOBSESSION15 at checkout and that's going to save you some, nec- uh, some money on that next order. So HootCamo.com. The Outdoor Call Radio app is another podcast partner, Outdoors Dan from Respect the Game TV. He created an app that you can download on any device where you can stream hunting shows and podcasts on a loop every single day. You will catch Fall Obsession podcasts playing on that loop on Mondays, that's the same day as our new publications, as well as tons of other hunting shows and podcasts that we all know and love. So go download the Outdoor Call Radio app today. It is free. You can start streaming immediately. And go follow Outdoors Dan on social media. He does a couple of different live radio shows a couple different times a week, and he shares those broadcasts on his Facebook Live if you're not local to those radio stations in the Midwest. So go follow Outdoors Dan and go download the Outdoor Call Radio app. Elite Archery is another fall obsession partner. Been shooting an elite bow for several years, and I love everything about them. They are, in my opinion, the most shootable bow on the market today, but the only way that you're going to know that is if you go try it. So I encourage everybody to go to your local elite dealer and take the elite shootability challenge, especially if you haven't shot an elite bow lately or at all. Technology changes very quickly in the archery industry. So that's why I always say that if it's been a minute since you had an elite bow in your hand, you should go check out what they got going on right now because they are, in my opinion, one of the best bows that you're going to buy. Ridge Rock Hunt Company is also a podcast partner. Derek Eves over there in Mississippi, he books hunts with vetted outfitters across the country. So if you're looking to book that next experience, perhaps your own once-in-a-lifetime bucket list hunt that you've been saving up for, then give Derek a call. He'll work with you on all the details and find something that works for you. Ridge Rock Hunt Company, go check them out. Finally, thank you guys again for tuning in to another Fall Obsession podcast. Be sure that you are following Fall Obsession on all the major social media platforms. Go subscribe to the YouTube channel. Subscribe and follow this podcast on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. We are on all the major podcast apps as well as Carbon TV, Waypoint TV, and the podcast episodes are also on our YouTube channel. Go to the website fallobsession.com. Check out everything that we have going on over there and maybe pick you up some apparel or something like that. Support a small-time hunting brand. We always appreciate it. That's all I got. We're heading over to our episode with Brett. Thank you guys for listening. This is another Fall Obsession podcast episode. Oh, her, dude. She's down. Let's go. Dude, I just shot a deer of a lifetime. Freaking smoke team. One with nature, and if you're a believer, one with God. Definitely gets your heart pumping. What? You are in trouble. Fall Obsession Podcast.
Welcome back, everybody, to another Fall Obsession podcast episode. My name is Sam, hosting you guys once again. My guest this week is Brett Rizell, the backcountry bow hunter. Welcome to our show, man. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, I'm super excited, man. I've uh, been looking you up on social media and, and following your journey and, and checking out one experience with your recent bear hunt for sure that we want to talk about on here today. Uh, pretty cool stuff. But for our listeners, for people who don't know who you are, if you want to take just a minute to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from, what you hunt. Yes, Brett Roselle. Uh, love to bow hunt. Um, want to bow hunt everything there is. I, I live in Kansas, so I grew up cutting my teeth on whitetails and uh, you know, I've had the chance to go to New Zealand and hunt red stag, and um, been to been all over the country hunting different critters. Been to South Texas, going after axis deer, um, mule deer, elk out in western in the west western states, um, and then here more recently, you know, got to get the opportunity to go to Russia and bow hunt some brown bear. So yeah, I love to bow hunt, and uh, then here recently, here in the last several months, we launched the clothing line as well, and and we're just in the process of getting that up and going to get that up, up on its feet. So that's, uh, I guess that's kind of me in a nutshell. That's awesome. Busy life for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Staying busy. Yeah. Absolutely. So you, you mentioned it, the, the Russian bear hunt, and, and that's obviously the big experience that I want to talk to you about on the show today. Um, but have you, before this hunt, what kind of bear hunting experience did you have, if any, in the United States? Yeah, absolutely zero. Yep, absolutely, absolutely zero. zero. So black bear, yeah, black bear's on my list, um, but it's just a little further down. You know, brown bear was right there at the top. And yeah, I got to look at my bucket list and it's a long list, I suppose, like everybody else's. And I just, I got to realize, man, I've, there's a chance that if I start at the bottom and work my way up, I may never make it to number one. I may run out of money or I may be too old or my health may go bad or whatever. And, and so then I just kind of switched my plans up and thought, you know what, let's just start at the top of the list and then just start working my way down and see how far I get. So eventually I'll be going after black bear at some point, uh, but it's a little further down. I've still got several other critters that I want to go after before a black bear. But yeah, I guess uh, if you're going to do it, you know, go big or go home. So I started wow. with about as big as bear as you can get. So Yeah, no doubt. What, uh, what interested you in that? Why, why was that number one? Oh, I, I have no idea. I mean, I know when I was a kid and I don't know what age I was, I would say, you know, seven, eight, nine, somewhere in there, probably. Um, I remember just, and I don't know who it was. Um, I know Fred bear. I remember seeing him shoot a giant brown bear. I remember seeing Chuck Adams shoot a giant brown bear. Um, and I remember seeing Jack Brittingham shoot a giant brown bear. I think those are kind of the first three. I don't remember who was first that I saw, uh, but those were the first three that I remember. And, you know, they all did it with a bow. And I just remember seeing pictures of them holding this giant paw up, you know. And uh, as a little boy, it just, I was like, I want to do that someday. I don't I don't know what the draw was. I don't know. You know, I think there's obviously an, danger, uh, an element of danger in there, um, adventure, um, you know, I don't know, all those things just kind of wrapped up into, I'm going to have to do that. I think, and I think a lot of it too is, is, is just pushing your limits to find out what you're capable of, you know, and you don't know what you're capable of until you push those limits and find out how far can I go? You know, what's in a lot of different areas, you know, your, your limits on strength, you know, there's a lot of guys that do weightlifting and they, they test their limits as far as how much can I lift, you know? Um, you know, there's thrill seekers out there as far as adrenaline, like how far can I push my adrenaline? Like, can I hold it together if I'm face to face with a giant brown bear, you know, with a bow in my hands? Yeah. Like what, you know, we all want to think that we can hold our composure together and that we can man up and, you know, but you don't know until you try. And so I think there's an element of just wanting to push, push my own limits for my own sake and just see how far I can go and how far I can take it. Um, so I, and I've always been a little bit of an adrenaline, adrenaline junkie, so so, yeah, I suppose at an early age, it's like, yeah, I'm going to have to do that at some point. And uh, eventually it just, I suppose I, at some point then I actually made an actual list and I'm like, yeah, that one's number one. Like, and it's right up there with an African lion. Like, that's another one that I want to do that's, I'd say those two are neck and neck. You know, I never, never wanted to put either one of them at number two. So they're both right there tied at number one. Um, I think, I think there's a little bit, uh, you know, if I think a, a cat might be a little more, a little more fear involved in that one. If I, if I was thinking about it, cause I think you think of a cat, they're more agile. Um, so 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, but again, a brown bear is just a lot larger in size. Um, you know, they both have their unique elements. Um, so yeah, it's it was up there at number one, and and uh, at some point, I just thought, you know what, let's uh, let's just go for number one. And so I just zoned in on brown bear and started looking at Kodiak Island and and the Alaskan Peninsula. And that's where I was really, you know, looking at it first because that's at least all the hunts that I had seen people go on, that's typically where they're going. You right. know, when I was younger, it's like, it's either Kodiak Island or the peninsula. And so I'm starting to zone in on that and, and do the research and, you know, look up outfitters. And I start making phone calls. And at some point I eventually had some money in my account, you know, and, and enough to, to start thinking about at least calling outfitters, you know? <clears throat> and so I just start making a list and making notes and calling references and, and, you know, you start looking at those hunts in Alaska and you're looking at 30,000 plus mm. and there's, you know, there's no guarantee that you're going to come home with one. You know, it's hunting. It's not killing. It's hunting. And so I just, man, I'm like, man, I've, I've got the money. It's not that I don't have the money, but I just kept thinking, what if I don't kill one like that? It's like that. I, uh, that's a chunk of change. That's going to be a long plane flight on the way home to yeah. just drop 30,000 and come home with nothing, you know? So you have to factor that in of there's a chance I may not get one. Um, and so am I willing to take the risk and drop that kind of money with a chance that I'll come home with nothing, especially with the bow? I mean, you, you do it with a bow and then you, you drastically decrease your odds, you know? So, and that's, that's what I wanted to do as a bow. I don't, and again, no, no, not knocking on rifle hunters, whatever, like to each their own. But for me personally, it's, again, it's a personal pursuit. It's each individual is different. And for me personally, I'm, I want to do it with a bow. It's, it's, that's part of me pushing my limits, and, and I want to be that close to that critter, and um, that just adds to the rush of it for me. So, yeah. so yeah, I started looking at those hunts, and I'm like, man, I can't. Even though I've got the money, I can't justify dropping that kind of money right now and potentially come home empty-handed. So um, I ended up seeing some other guys. They got back from Russia at one point, and I'm like, ooh, Russia. Like, I never even considered it, you know, considered that. I knew they had some bears, but I didn't know how big they were. So then I started doing more research, and, and I ended up finding out that they've got a, a much larger population in Russia than anywhere else in the world. Like, like it's not even close to how many brown bears they have versus anywhere else, you know. So I'm like, okay, so they've got more bears, so so surely the, the success rate has to be higher, you know. Um, so then I start doing some more research and then start making some phone calls, and and come to find out there, you know, there's several outfitters that will guide, you know, brown bear hunts on on the Kamchatka Peninsula, which is far east Russia. And so then you just start narrowing it down and calling again, calling references and just doing more research. And, you know, you're putting all your eggs into one basket of hopefully, hopefully you're picking a good outfitter, you know, that's going to do their best to put you on a good bear. And, you know, again, it's you're just taking a lot of risks, you know, yeah. um, you know, and I ended up finding out that it was half the cost. So that was a huge, that was a huge selling point when I found out it was half the cost. It's like, shoot, I can go twice, you know? So if I don't kill one well on the first trip, I can go back a second time for the price that it would cost me to go to Alaska, you know? So that was a huge selling point. Um, and then the more that I started thinking about Russia, the more that I started to fall in love with the idea of Russia, as opposed to Kodiak or the peninsula um, of Alaska. Cause I'm like, yeah, this, this isn't something that everybody does. Right. Like who, who wants to do the thing that everybody else is doing? Like, why not pave your own way and, and start a new trend or, or do something that not a lot of people have done? And, you know, again, I'm not like I was the first by any means, but there's just not a lot of people going to Russia, you know? And so then I just started to fall more in love with that as opposed to Kodiak or the peninsula. Um, and I'm like, yeah, it's freaking Russia. Like, that's even that's even cooler you know and uh so yeah so that it just set things in motion and sure sure enough um at the sci and and uh thought you know what and i had the money it's like let's do it so i dropped the money dropped a big and I, I paid for most of my hunt up front i mean i had it and i'm like you know what well i've got it right now i better just drop it all right now before i do something stupid and blow <laughs> this on something and uh so i just i paid for the majority of my hunt right there i still had a little bit left that i paid for later but uh yeah i dropped the majority of it right then and then sure enough fast forward three months later the war breaks out yeah and i'm like you have got to be kidding me so i booked this before the war had started and uh so then the war happens and i'm like you gotta be kidding me like just my luck and i i'm telling you like i'd put down a hefty deposit you know and i'm just like how does this work and uh, so I was in constant communication with the outfitter and just trying to figure out what does this look like. Um, and so we had to push it back a year, which now fast forward. So from the time that I booked it, the war happens. Fast forward maybe a couple of months because now I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm probably never going to Russia. 
and I still had quite a bit of money in my account. Like it wasn't like I was hurting for money. We were in a, you know, God was, God had been good and put us in a position where we had some money saved up and we're actually looking to buy some land is what we're looking to do. Yeah. And, uh, long story short, this other opportunity had kind of presented itself and it was something I'd always wanted to do, but never thought it was possible. And, and next thing you know, here I am starting a clothing line. And so this was, you know, this was about two years to the date now that I had started this endeavor with the clothing. And I thought, well, rush is never going to happen. So whatever. And then this other opportunity presented itself and it was too good to pass up. I'm like, you know what, now's the time. Like we've, it's either buy land or start a clothing company. And so I'm like, all right, let's go all in on the clothing. And my wife gave me the green light and she's bless her heart. She's a wonderful support system. And she's like, why not, you know, go for it. So, so we, uh, we dropped a bunch of money in this sucker and we just started dumping money into this clothing line. And and we spent two years just developing and testing products and, and designing all this stuff. And I designed all the, everything you see, I designed from the camouflage pattern to the logo, to the, the clothing itself, like all of the designs of everything you see, the website, everything, like I've, I've literally done it all. The only thing I didn't do was run the needle. Um, and so I was working with a factory overseas, obviously to manufacture the stuff and uh yeah so so now fast forward we postponed the russia hunt one year which it ended up working out perfectly because if we would have gone the time that it was that we had originally booked it for now even though i had samples and stuff my clothing wasn't technically finished yet and so it worked out great because it pushed it back another year which put me at the two-year mark in my clothing endeavor and now that i go to russia now i have the actual finished product of my clothing and the first animal that I shot in my finished clothing line was number one on my bucket list. That's amazing. So literally here I, yeah. So here I am like, again, I, I think, I think God probably had his hand involved in that. Cause here I am literally shooting number one bucket list, a dream of mine while wearing another dream of mine. And it was, it was, it just added to the whole thing. I mean, you, you know, that's something I couldn't have scripted out. I couldn't have wrote that in the story, you know, yeah. Um, so that was, that was just a whole nother element that added to it. And I'm like, this is the coolest thing ever. Like, thank you, God, that was awesome. You know? (laughs) So yeah, I don't, it'll be hard to top that. I mean, it'll be really hard to top that. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Just, yeah. Everything coming together like that and it it all worked out. I want to ask you about, um, Russia though, going over there, you, you you talked about, you know, how your interest just kind of spiked and you, you know, got, you, you were committed to that. You were, you were all in on that idea right. leading up into booking that hunt and everything. But for somebody going over there from the United States or wherever wanting to hunt bear, yeah. how, <clears throat> excuse me, what do, what do the hunting regulations look like in Russia or is it just the wild West out there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think there's a little bit of that element, the wild West, but I do know that there are, there are tags. So, so when we got over there um, and keep in mind the, the outfitter that I was with, they spoke very little English. Okay. Like, so we were with four, there were four guys, they had four snowmobiles and three of them. So they, they knew the word professional because it was funny because they'd always like, there were so many times where we were fixing snowmobiles. Like we kept these, cause they would run these suckers. Like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> I mean, we, we were going 65 to 70, 75 miles per day on these things for the first three days because we didn't have good weather. So we couldn't glass. Um, so we just had to just spend time on the snowmobiles trying to cut tracks, but I mean, we're crossing creeks, we're going through trees, we're crossing these wooden bridges that they built by hand. Like, I mean, they were running these suckers in there. So they constantly break down and it's funny because they'd have to fix it. And then they just be like professional, you know, cause they got all the tools and everything, you know? So they, there's like a handful of words that they actually knew as far as English, big bear. That was one big bear, big bear. Big bear. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, but uh, then the then the other guy. So the, there was three that didn't have didn't know much at all about English, and then the other guy he he had a little bit more. He probably had maybe thirty words in his bag, you know. <laughs> so again, he's got thirty words of English, and so you're trying to use these words and point, and you know. Um, but in the midst of now, we did have an interpreter later that when we were actually going back, and we got to pick her brain, and and she gave us more insight and stuff. That's where we learned a little bit more. Um, but basically they have territories. It sounds like it's similar to Alaska. So it is, it is regulated. I mean, the government does regulate it. Um, and there are restrictions as far as what's legal, what's not, whatever. Um, and I, you know, again, I don't know Russian, I can't read Russian, but I do know that when I shot my bear, you know, immediately, well, I shortly after, so they, they, they caped him out. And when they, when they went to put the cape in the bag, they also filled out paperwork before they put the cape in the bag. And so they filled out some sort of paperwork 
and they put it in like a plastic, oh, just like a plastic sheet so it wouldn't get blood on it and stuff, you know, and then they put that in the bag with it. Gotcha. Um, so I'm assuming that was my tag of some sort. Um, and I know that we also, so when we first landed um, in Kamchatka, which is which is basically where we were hunting, it was in the peninsula that we were hunting in. Um, when we landed there, we were in the city, we had to go to some other place. I don't know where we were, but we had to show them our passports and we had to show them our driver's license and, and they were filling out paperwork. And I, again, I don't speak Russian, but I was, I'm just assuming that this is the paperwork for our bear. So that without a way, when this goes out, they know who this bear is tied to. Right. Um, so, but yeah, so they've got territories and, and I found out too, that the outfit that we were hunting with they actually have the largest territory on the Kamchatka Peninsula of any other outfitter. Oh, wow. And so they kind of, it sounds like they kind of lease it from the government, like they lease these large territories, and it's like, okay, this is your territory, and we're going to allot you so many bear tags. And they've got moose, and they've got, you know, snow sheep, and they've got caribou as well in this territory. It's a, I mean, it's a huge territory. Um, but uh, so, yeah, they, they basically they allot them so many tags, and I don't know how many. You know, I have no idea what, what the number is. Um, but the government does regulate that, and they allot them so many tags, and what you get is what you get. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's. Uh, but again, at the same token, you're still you're still far east. Like I don't, you know, I don't know if there's game wardens or not. I don't know. I I do know it was kind of interesting. So when we were driving, we had a two hour drive from when we landed in the airport in Kamchatka. We had a two hour drive um, to get to where we were going, and then when we got there, we left the trucks, and then we had a two hour snowmobile ride back into our camp. Oh, wow. So we are literally in the middle of freaking nowhere. Yeah. It's, it's nowhere, nowhere, but on our way in the midst of that two hour drive, we stopped at a little cafe and we got some lunch there real quick. And honestly, if, if it wasn't for all the Russian signs and everybody speaking Russian around you, it felt like a little cafe in the Midwest, like on a deer hunt, because there was a lot of guys coming in and camouflage. And I don't know if they were moose hunting. I don't know if, you know, well, it wouldn't have been moose because it was spring. But, uh, yeah, I don't know if they were fishing. I don't know if they were all bear hunting. I don't know if they just like wearing camouflage because, I mean, you just see people coming into camouflage, you know. Yeah. And uh, so it's, yeah, I mean, it felt like a lot like, yeah, we're just on a deer hunt in the Midwest. And, and it's like opening day here, you know, like guys are just coming in left and right. And, and it, it felt it felt like home minus the fact that everything was in Russian and everybody was speaking in Russian, you know. <laughs> um but yeah, you'd be driving on, you know, there's a main road, a uh, main paved road before we got up onto the gravel and you'd see people driving, they'd have boats and, you know, no different than what we got here. They've had John boats. There was some air boats that, that we'd see and, and they're all camouflaged up or whatever. And it's like, okay, like these are my people. Like, you know, we speak a different language. We're in a different part of the world, but we're, we're kin here. Like with these, I felt, I felt at home. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was it was neat just to see that. That was a real cool experience. It's you know you you hear a lot in the media and as far as you know we're we're told to hate Russians and Russians are probably told to hate Americans. You know, um, but when I landed there in Kamchatka, I'm like, these people are great. Like you know, I mean, it's a third world country. It, you know, it is what it is. It's it's definitely they don't have near the near the luxuries that we have here. You know, I mean, you definitely land and and you can see that it's you know, the houses aren't the, the nicest houses and it's definitely a third world country. But aside from that, like the people are, the people were good people from what I can tell. I yeah. mean, yeah, I, that was, that was real neat to see. Well, so, well, that, that's a, that's a testament to the hunting community as a whole, you know, it, people from different oh, backgrounds, yeah. Oh, yeah. in this case, different nationalities, different cultures all together and all with one one big thing in common that brings them together and that's hunting in the outdoors. And that's, that's awesome to hear. That's, that's really cool. That that's your, your perspective on that. That's awesome. Yeah. So <clears throat> flying in there, and I'm just, I'm purely curious with this, as far as taking your bow yeah. from America to Russia on this uh -huh. hunt, was that super complicated? Uh, so no, it wasn't. Um, in fact, I mean, a bow is real easy. I've, that's all I've ever traveled with is a bow. Right. So I don't know any different. Um, so there was the, so <laughs> a gun, I think is a little bit more difficult. Yeah. Um, man, how much time we got? Cause there's, there's, I, I got all stories. the, I got all the time in the world, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when I, so when I booked the hunt, I, I went through like a booking agency, essentially, another outfitter that kind of has a booking agency and books it with the outfitter that's actually in Russia then. And there was, and from my understanding, I was the only guy that was going. Um, and come to find out, there was another guy who had booked with another booking agency with the same outfitter in Russia. And I had no clue until like a couple of weeks before I left and come to find out, 
you know, there's another guy from the U.S. And I'm like, sweet, well, give me his number. Maybe we can meet up in Turkey. So we flew into Istanbul, Turkey. So basically, we were responsible for booking our flights from the U.S. to Turkey. And then from Turkey, they the, the Russian outfitter, they actually booked our flights then from Turkey to Moscow, from Moscow to Kamchatka, and then back to Turkey again on our way back. And then we were responsible of getting back from Turkey to the U.S. Um, so... Yeah, about two weeks before we left, I ended up getting his information. I said, hey, what time are you flying in Turkey? And he gave, you know, so we ended up meeting up when we landed in Turkey. And uh, we are, I don't know, we're probably four hours out from flying into Moscow. And he's, he's a, what was he, I think 71 years old. His name was the good dude, good dude. Um, just an older man who he had two, he had a cortisone shot in both knees, had cortisone shots in both wrists. Um definitely overweight like the dudes he's on the downhill side and he was even saying he's like this is probably my last time you know like this is probably it yeah <laughs> and uh but we were talking in turkey then there before we were flying out to moscow and he was telling me that he was actually in kamchaka back in 2019 of course this was way before the war had even broken out and and if you go to the the moscow airport so whenever if you're taking a gun or a bow that those types of cases for whatever reason they go in the oversized luggage part and so when you get off when you and the airport wasn't nearly as big as i thought it would be. i thought the moscow airport would be ginormous but it wasn't nearly as big as i thought it was going to be um in fact when you land you actually you know they they drive the plane up to the to the facility i guess and and they actually wheel out some stairs to the to the door and so you actually walk down the stairs and get on the tarmac and then you have to go to a bus and then the, they take the bus and then they bus you into the facility. But so we get in and when he was telling me back in 2019 that, you know, he picks up his luggage. They got the same little belt system that we have in the U S you know, where you're waiting for your luggage to go around the big deal and you pick it off. <clears throat> and so he got his luggage off. He got his clothing off that, but his gun wasn't there. So he's, he's trying to figure out where's my gun, you know, and nobody there speaks English. And so finally, eventually he got directed to where it's oversized luggage. So he had to go to the oversized luggage. Well, that kind of took him, that takes you to a separate area away from like the metal detectors where they scan cases and stuff and scan your bags. And so he went over there and got his gun. And again, he, you don't know what you don't know, you know, you're not from here. And so he grabbed his gun and, and then just proceeded to walk where the exit signs were and stuff and whatever, but he had never gone through the metal detectors. Or, so basically he, that allowed him to take his, which is a dumb, they've, they've got it set up dumb. Like that's, that's partly their fault, you know, right. as far as the, the Russian airport goes. Um, cause it, that allows you to go around kind of the security system that technically you should be taking your gun through. <laughs> and so he, and he doesn't know, he just grabs his gun and just goes and walks out, you know, long story short, he comes back from Camp Chaka then. And when he lands, so he's coming out and as he's walking down the stairs again, he sees police cars. He's like, what's going on here? You know, before his feet even hit the tarmac, they've got him in handcuffs. Oh, wow. And they throw him in the cop car and they wheel, yeah, they wheel him around and they take him to like a little police department within the airport itself. And of course, they're all speaking Russian and they're all, you know, and he's like, I English, English, like, I don't, you know, what's going on? What's going on? And so it was, it was a huge ordeal. I mean, and he's telling me all this and I'm just like, are you kidding me? Like, I'm I'm going into Russia with a convicted felon of Russian, you know, like like this is like why are you telling me this? This is crazy, like and so now in my mind I'm like I wish we'd have never met. Like now we're just sitting together on the plane, when we land, like they're gonna they're gonna know you and they're gonna think that I'm with you because clearly we're the only two Americans on this plane and they're right. gonna think that I'm with you and now guilty by association I'm screwed, you know. <laughs> so so he tells me that and. And so we land, and it was funny too because he was telling me about the guy that that he thought was causing all the problems back in 2019. He was telling me he said he's a younger guy, and I just think that he just had it out for me. He was just, you know, trying to set an example and throw his weight around and use that badge. You know how younger guys can let that badge go to their head, you know. And so right. he's telling me about this younger guy. He's like, I just think he was the problem, and and he was the one that caused all the problems, and it didn't need to be that bad. And and it was, dude, it was a whole, it was a whole like. There's so much to the story. So he was, he was even got tied into the mafia when he was there dude it's it's oh my it's, word oh, we ain't got enough time for it it's like <laughs> dean is a story in and of himself so oh yeah so they set up a sting operation because basically there was a lady there that was watching his gun um they set up a sting operation and they got him like wired up and they're sending him out to meet with this lady to go get his gun oh it was crazy it, oh, it's my. crazy like i'm telling you oh yeah it's a whole nother story so he's telling me all this and i'm like this 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 wasn't just I'll, this just this wasn't your normal altercation i'll just say that like this was far beyond that. 
And so he's telling me all this as literally as we're like four hours, three hours out from flying to the Moscow. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Like of all the things that I got to be with this guy. So we land and uh, as you, as you get coming in there, there's, you've got to go through these lines. They've got these, um, oh, think of probably like 60 small little cubicles that are all glass. They're all, they're just like small glass squares. They're all tied together. You've got tinted glass across all these. So you can't see in. And then each one has a little door that you've got to walk through, but you, you've got to wait for your line. And so you go in the line and you walk in this little box, this little glass box, and then you turn to your left. And then, then you can actually see the people, you know, in the box that you couldn't see before. And so like normal, you just, I'm just walking. I just picked the shortest line. And so I get in line and, and Dean's right behind me. I wish he wasn't, but he is. <laughs> and so, cause I'm like, I don't want to be associated with this guy, you know? <laughs> and so and Dean's a good guy. Nothing against Dean whatsoever. I just, at this time, I'm just like, I don't know if this is good for me to yeah, be with him. I'm here you know? for a bear hunt. Come and on so, now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just want to kill a bear and get out of here. That's all I want. So <laughs> So sure enough, I get I go into the little cubicle and then I take my passport. And I slide underneath the glass, you know, and and the lady looks at it and, and as soon as she sees it, she looks at me and and as soon as she looked at me, I was like, I'm gonna be here a while, like because as soon as she, she could just see that you know it's an American passport right away, yeah. and they probably don't see a lot of those here lately. So she just looks at me and I'm like, all right, this is this is where it all starts, you know. Well, then she just there's a there's a guy also in the cubicle. So there's the lady, then there was a younger guy. And so then she she hands the passport back to him. He grabs the passport, looks at it, looks at me, and does this. Oh. And I'm like, all right, now here we go. And so now I'm, I've got to walk back through the same line that I just came through. So I'm walking past Dean on my way out, and the guy who has my passport, he went out kind of a different way. And, and uh, so, but I've still got to follow him. I've got to go back through the line and, and meet up with him, and then he's got to take me to wherever we're going. Well, as he walks out of the room and as I'm passing Dean, Dean says, that's the guy. That's the guy. And I'm like, oh, crap. Oh, oh no. no. That's the young guy that screwed him over in 2019. I'm like, and so right then I'm like, we're done. We're done. Like, I'm. I, this is where I lose my life. Like, I'm going to be in jail for the next 20 years, you know? And so, oh, so no. sure enough, I follow him. And he doesn't speak any English at all. And he just points at the floor like, like, sit, sit down. I'm like, okay. So I sit down outside of this room and I've got my back up against the wall and he goes inside and, uh, I'm, you know, they're running paperwork, doing whatever. And then they come back out and I, and like I said, Dean was right behind me. So now he's, he's dealing with his passport and sure enough, who sits right beside me, Dean sits right beside me on the floor and I'm like, oh no, like, I don't want to need no, how about you sit over there? Like, like, let's, <laughs> let's put, you know, 10 feet, 20 feet between us. Let's not sit right beside each other, you know? And, uh, <laughs> they end up taking him into the, so this has been, there's so much to this. So on that plane flight from Turkey to Moscow, there was a drunk guy on the plane and he had the aisle seat. And so he was completely passed out drunk. And so there was a lady next to me who had the, the window seat. I was in the middle and he had the aisle seat. Well, she had to get up and, and use the restroom in the midst of that. And he, I'm trying to nudge him. Dude, he's, he's passed out. You're not yeah. waking him up. And so we had to climb over top of this guy um, but in the midst of that, I thought, man, I, I see, cause I just, I document everything. Like I just take pictures and I want to take pictures of that, cause, and I also want those first person, just personal use, you know, like I want to come home and show my wife and I want to show my two little boys like, Hey, look at this, you know, look what I saw, whatever. And so I ended up snapping a picture of me with this drunk guy and he's, uh, he's passed out and I'm, you know, I'm taking a selfie with me and him <laughs> in it, you know? So that plays into this. So I take that picture. I'm like, Oh, this is funny you know this would be cool and I'm, you know i send the wife a text message as soon as we landed in moscow i send her and i send it to her and say hey you know i got to ride next to this guy on the way to moscow whatever <clears throat> and so they end up taking dean into this into this interrogation room and they shut the door behind him and, and it's soundproof like i can't hear anything of what's going on in this room i don't know if they're throwing chairs i don't know if they shot dean in the head i don't i don't know what's going on you know yeah and so i'm sitting out there with my back against the wall and i'm sitting there and i'm like man i want to take a picture of this so bad like i want to take a picture like of a selfie with me and you can see the tinted glass back behind me, but up there's cameras all over this place. And I'm like, but sure as the world, I take my phone out and they're going to think like I'm a spy, a spy, like taking pictures of how do you get through customs or, you know, whatever. So I'm just like, I was so torn. Cause I'm like, I, I really want to film something or take a picture of this interaction because this doesn't happen every day, you know, like, and if I make it out of this, I want to be able to tell this story and have pictures to prove it, you know? Yeah. But I'm like, I just, in my mind, I'm like, no, I need to, I need to mind my P's and Q's here. Like, so I just left my phone in my pocket, didn't take any pictures. <clears throat> well, then Dean comes out after probably an hour and a half. And uh, he says, man, they went through my phone and everything. Like they went through all my apps. They pulled up my apps. They went through all my pictures. And and when he said they went through all my pictures, my immediate thought was, 
oh no, I took a picture of that drunk guy. <laughs> and I'm like, what if he's like, what if he is like buddies with one of these guys or something, you know, like, oh, like, I hope this doesn't come back and bite me in the butt. Like, I'm I'm screwed. Like, I'm screwed. Like, sure enough, he's going to end up being like best buddies with one of these guys or his dad's going to end up like working for customs or something stupid, you know? Yeah. And so I start, I start sweating a little bit. I'm not going to lie. And uh, so long story short, the outfitter had given us a phone number and he said, if you have any troubles in customs, give this guy a call. Have them give this guy a call. Well, Dean didn't do that right out of the gate. And so finally he said, I was like, Dean, did you give him the number? He's like, no, I didn't. I didn't think about it. I'm like, well, give them the number. Like next time you you go back in, if they bring you back in or whatever, give them the number. Because at this point, they they brought an interpreter, and so sure enough, he goes back in, and and sure enough, he gives them the number. And then before you know it, we're out through the gate, you know, within 20 minutes. Um, but still, it was we were in there for three hours, and it's like this. It was, it was a pretty intense three hours. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. Um, but we made it through, and uh, then when we got to Camp Chaka, it was easy peasy. We didn't go through anything in Camp Chaka. We didn't go through any customs. We didn't go through any metal detectors. Like literally, we got the VIP treatment. Um, a lady, a lady picked us up in this van, and we went a separate way of everybody else that went on the buses. And she took our luggage tickets, and she said, and she took us back to this this VIP room, and that's what they call it. The is the VIP room, and is they had a bar back there, and they had free drinks and everything. And we're wow. we're literally sitting in this lounge. And I'm drinking my water, and Dean's drinking his beer, and, and we're just sitting there. And sure enough, she comes back with her luggage and says, "Here's your luggage." And we walk out the back door, and away we go. Wow. Like it was, and I'm like, and I'm sitting there thinking, like, did somebody get paid? You know, like <laughs> this. I feel like we should have gone through something, at least one metal detector or something. You know, like so. So yeah, that was our. I guess that was our flight in. Um, wow. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I guess so. Uh, you know, absolutely. That that's a <laughs> that's a crazy story, man. Golly, I can't even imagine. That's awesome. <laughs> not well, not awesome that it. I mean, but, happened but to all you, that. But... Right, but I mean, but but see, but all of that adds to the adventure. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, if I had just gone to Alaska, it wouldn't be nearly. Now, now I think, granted, there's still the risk factor. You know, there's still the unknown of, what if I do get thrown in jail or something? You know, and obviously my wife, she's on pins and needles. Like that's all that's going through her mind is. The bear's going to kill me. If the bear doesn't kill me, Putin's going to throw me in jail. You know, like those right. are the two things that she's thinking like, and yeah. So that's all she can think about, you know. Um, but for me, like those, and that's why I fell in love with Russia. Like, and and when the war happened, like as dumb as this may sound, I kind of got a little bit excited. I'm like, if I can actually pull this off and actually go in the country while there's a war going on and all the, you know, all the animosity and turmoil and everything that's happening, if I can get in and get out, like, how much cooler would that be? Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like, this isn't Alaska. This isn't the safety net of Alaska, and you're on U.S. soil. This is freaking Russia. Like, that's even cooler yet. Like, and I'm, you know, and again, people are different, but for me, I'm a little bit of an adrenaline junkie, and I, I like the element of the fact that all of that stuff was happening. I mean, two weeks before we our plane flight left, they had a terrorist attack. You know, they traced it back to Hamas, and, and so it added to that. And so literally when I'm sitting there on the floor— you know, the only other people that were there were also people like of Iraqi descent. You know what I'm saying? Like they're the darkest skinned guys. And, and yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah. there's a reason why they're sitting on the floor next to me. Cause yeah. there was literally a terrorist attack by those types of people two weeks before that, you know? And so I'm sitting there, I'm like, this, this is it. Like, and so, yeah, your heart's racing and, and it's, I mean, I think that's why we hunt in, in general. It's the heart racing. It's the, your hands shaking after you shoot, like, I mean, isn't that why we do it? Like, I was always told that if you ever lose that feeling, to stop, you right. know? And so when you go to Russia, I mean, you're just taking that heart racing to a whole other level. And then when you're you're face-to-face -face with a brown bear, again, that heart racing, it, it's bumping up another 30 to 40%. Like, that's why we do it is for the adrenaline rush. I mean, not just the adrenaline rush, but everything else that you get to encounter and experience along the way, you know? Yeah. So... Yeah, Russia, absolutely, hands down, best adventure of my life, no question. And I, Lord willing, knock on wood, I want to go back without a doubt. That's awesome. <clears throat> I I think back as you're as you're talking about this and as you're you're summing, we I mean we haven't even gotten to the hunt yet, but as you're summing up your trip and everything, right. um, uh, it was actually a quote that you had in one of your posts about it, um, and it says the harvest of the animal is only a small percentage of why we hunt. And oh yeah, the, yeah. I think that that talking to you and learning, you know, about your experience and everything, it, it's certainly applicable to this. It's it's crazy. It's awesome. Well, 
Well, that's, I mean, that's just it. Like, well, look at how much we've talked yet. And, and we haven't even, that's just it. We haven't even talked about the hunt yet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, that, that's what I'm saying. Like, hunting is about the entire experience. And, and yes. the kill of the animal is such a small percentage of that. Yes. Like, there's, we haven't even got to the fact of, we haven't even got to the snowmobile ride into camp yet. Like, the two hour ride into camp, I can't, we crossed all these wooden bridges that they had built by hand. Like, I, so, so we, we parked the deals and I'm sitting there looking, I'm like, there ain't no camp around here, you know? And I'm like, so where's camp? And then he's like, and he points towards this, what I thought was a mountain at the time, turned, come to find out it was a volcano. Oh, wow. And I'm like, oh, how cool is this? Like, who gets to hunt next to a volcano? You know what I'm saying? Like, this yeah. is the coolest stuff ever. Like, <laughs> where do you find this stuff? You know, only in Russia, you know, like you, and you, yeah. So, so he points towards this, what I, like I said, I thought it was a mountain. I was like, oh, okay, camp's over there by the mountain, you know, later I find out it's a volcano. But, uh. Um, so they had a snowmobile waiting there and then he drives the snowmobile back in and I'm like, so what are we doing here? Like, there's no way we're getting on this one snowmobile. And then sure enough, here come three other guys. You know, they, they radioed in and sure enough, here comes three other guys. And I was like, holy cow, like they just came out of the middle of nowhere. Like there's just trees and just, it looks like Alaska. It looked a lot like Alaska. Yeah. And next thing you know, you see some snowmobiles coming. It's like, where are these guys coming from? You know, like I'm looking for smoke or something like a smoke from a smokestack from a cabin. I don't see anything. So I don't know where these guys are coming from. And uh, so we just hop on this thing. Long story. I mean, it ended up being a two hour ride back into camp, you know, but, but I'd say within the first 15 minutes of the snowmobile, ride, We come to this river and I'm like, how are we going to cross this thing? Like this is a decent sized river and it's, it's it, there's no way you're running the snowmobile through this river because it's too deep. Like you can just looking at it, you know it's too deep. Yeah. And uh, so I'm like, how are they gonna cross this? Like, and we, dude, I'm not kidding you. But we come to that first bridge, and I posted pictures of that first. I posted pictures of several bridges. I bet they had probably 30 to 40 of these different bridges. Some were some were made by you know actual lumber that was you know like one buys or whatever. Um, and then some were just trees that literally they just cut trees down and just lay them over top, and then they they nail trees and they they build a bridge across a little stream or a creek or whatever and, and take the snowmobiles across these things and away we go. Like, I mean, it's the coolest thing. So, yeah, we come to that first bridge and as soon as we get to that first bridge, I'm like, yep, take my money. Take my money because I'm coming back. Like, this is already cool. Like, the fact that we're going to cross this thing, we had to lean to our left because this bridge tilted to the right you know, on the way in. And so, and my guy, he's like, he's like, he's pointing this way. I'm like, no, no, no. I, I can see how the bridge is tilted. I know that I have to shift my body way you know so, yeah. so we're leaning this way you know so that way we doesn't we don't fall in you know and i'm like this is this is cool like this is all part of the adventure wow and so we're crossing these bridges on the way back to camp and then we pull into camp and it's just like this old trapper's lodge and you know got a big caribou rack on it and i mean it's it's, it's the adventure of a lifetime man it's it's the, that's the that's why we do it that's why we do it <laughs> and so then yeah we get back into camp and and I guess you want no. I guess I can continue with the hunt. I don't know what you. Yeah, you know, yeah. Question. Keep keep going, man. Yeah, we're <laughs> yeah, we're rolling. Yeah, so, it's awesome. So we pull in, and uh, so we pull into camp, and uh, so the weather was bad for the first about three and a half days, and and so typically what they like to do is they like to get up on one of these mountains because there were mountains as well, and so they like to get up on these mountains, and and there's parts where you can see a long ways and just glass a long ways, and and if you can't see, I mean, one, it's easy to see a big brown bear when it's all white and snow. So the snow is just starting to melt. You know, these bears are coming up out of hibernation. For the most part, a lot of stuff was still, I mean, it was 25 to 40 degrees is what the temperatures were when we were there. Um, and so what they typically like to do is they'll they'll run snowmobiles, and if they cut a track, great, but for the most part, they can get up on these high points in glass, and it's real easy to pick out a big brown bear, you know, in the snow. And if you don't see a brown bear, it's real easy to see tracks. Yeah. And so they'll glass the tracks and like, okay, I think that's a big enough track. Let's at least drive over there and check it out and see how big it actually is. Um, but the, for the first three and a half days, we didn't, we couldn't do that because it was, the weather was just, it was raining, it was miserable. Um, but again, I, I'm kind of glad that was the case because it allowed us to experience more stuff. Yeah. But uh, then I, we, we expand on that later, but so, so yeah, we weren't able to glass because it was just, the clouds were just low. And so if you're up on the mountain, you can't see anything because you're up at a high elevation, the clouds just set in on you. And so what we did for the first three and a half days is we just, we just rode snowmobiles. And I asked them, and of course, everything's in kilometers over there. So I had to, you know, I had to do the math on that. But basically we went six, anywhere from 65 to 75 miles every day. Like I'm talking, wow. yeah, sun up, sun down, running these snowmobiles nonstop. Um, but it, it was a lot of fun. I mean, so we're going through, I can't tell you how many rivers and creeks and streams we were driving through and canyons and up and down over mountains and through mountain and, and just, 
so so man we saw so much stuff we saw i can't i don't even know there's several different bird species that i have no clue what they were but i'm like well that's cool you know like all these different birds um there was some kind of eagle or a giant hawk of some sort that we saw I'm like that's pretty neat um there were speckle belly geese so they had the same geese that we have here in the states they had some speckle belly geese that were flying i recognize their noise and i look up and, and of course they're all pointing too and i'm like yeah i know exactly what those are like we hunt those back home so they had the same species of, of speckle belly geese um whenever we were going on some rivers and creeks they had mallards they had mallard ducks there same as we've got in the states here i'm like well that's kind of neat i didn't you know had no clue and of course if you think about it again alaska is not that far um they had uh Oh, they had some buffalo head ducks. They had several species of ducks that I saw, and I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what we've got in the States. Um, and we saw wolverine tracks. We saw a fox. That was on that was day five. That was actually when I shot my bear. That was before I shot my bear. Um, we, we were across the – and I didn't get – that was one thing I, I – one of the things I regret is we didn't – I didn't get any footage, and I didn't get any picture of these snow bridges. So – and they were, they were sketchy. Some of them were sketchy. <laughs> So basically, it snows so much, like literally, and he was telling me, he said, typically the snow would be, you know, he say snow this, no, high, this high, this high, and he'd show me at camp how high it would be. And I'm like, holy cow, like this snow would be literally 10 foot deep. Like they get a wow. ton of snow at this area, apparently. He said, typically this time of year snows this deep. And I'm like, really? Like, holy cow. So the snow was melting quicker this year than it was the previous years. Um so, but you get that much snow and literally this snow, of course, everything freezes up. Your creeks freeze up, you know, your, some of your rivers even freeze up. Um, so you get that much snow on top. Well, then what happens is stuff starts to melt. The water is running underneath of that snow. And so the water's flowing, but you still have, who knows how many foot of snow. Yeah. And so you're, you're able to cross these creeks, these small creeks or these small streams and never go through the water because you've got a snow bridge. Wow. Well, but surely, surely, yeah, so surely as it's melting, you know, more and more, that snow is getting thinner, that snow bridge is getting thinner, thinner from the bottom and from the top too a little bit. And so there were some, there were some snow bridges that literally when we crossed, it dropped out underneath of us and I'm on the back of this thing. <laughs> and so like literally I can feel myself drop as the snow bridge collapses underneath of us, but we just make it across. And then, of course, he's pointing like, no, 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 go down. You're like, don't cross this one anymore because it's done. And so it's like we could fall through this snow bridge and fall. There were some literally you could have fallen, I bet, 10 to 15 foot easily. Oh, wow. And fallen down into this this small stream. You know, none of, they weren't big rivers, but you know, they'd have a lot of these small streams. And it's like if we fall through this snow bridge and I didn't get – I wished I would have just taken the time to set up a camera seat, but they didn't. And I think they felt the pressure, too, because they knew the weather was bad. And so they knew that we're just going to have to cover a lot of ground and just burn up these snowmobiles and just go all over the mountainside. Um, and I, like I said, I don't even – they had GPSs on all of the snowmobiles, so they knew where we were at. We covered – I don't even know how much ground we covered. Like I said, it was it was 65 to 75 miles a day um, just going all over the countryside. Like I don't I don't know how large of a territory we covered, but it was massive. Um, so there's So there's a lot of – there's a lot of stuff that I wasn't able to film just because they weren't in filming mode. It's right. like, no, we have to get you a bear. That's our job is to get you a bear. We're not going to take the time to set up the nice cameras and, and film everybody crossing this little snow bridge and film icicles dripping water. And you know what I'm saying? Like it wasn't, <laughs> it's like, no, I'm pretty much filming whatever I can with my phone. And, 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 and even then I'm trying to hang on with both hands, especially when we cross these snow bridges. Cause it's like, cause some of them would drop out underneath of you, yeah. you know? So I'm like, I, so I didn't film any of those. I didn't get any pictures of those, and those were really cool. Like, I wish I got more pictures and got some video footage, but I did. Um, so, yeah, so first three days, first three and a half days, just weather was just crappy. Um, but we uh, we caught, we cut one track. Uh, we And we cut a lot of tracks, but they, we, we wouldn't go after them unless it was a big track, you know. So I remember my first big track. That is one thing I will never forget. Like, and it's, and I've, I've been to the big conventions, and I've, I've, I've taken my hand, I've placed them on the bear's palm, you know, and it's like, well, okay, now I know how big they are. And because I'm trying to figure out, okay, what's a big bear? And, and so, because I know that I'm going to go on this Russian hunt and I want to know, I want to know if the outfitters put me on a big bear when I put my hand down on this, on this snow right, print. Yeah. Like, like, okay, I know this is a big one because I put my palm, but you know, whatever. So, so I'll never forget the first big one. And he's like, big bear, big bear. And I'm like, can I, can I get out? You know, so I get off the snowmobile and I, I put my hand down to this thing and I'm just like, holy cow this thing is and i and i knew like i knew they were that big but for the first time in my life i'm putting my hand in the print 
of an animal that's alive in these woods somewhere. Right. Like this, this isn't a dead one at a show. This is a live one that literally just left this who knows how long ago, like at least within the last day for sure. And that sucker is out here somewhere like, and he could kill us. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, this, you don't mess with these things. Like this, just massive. So I, I will never forget the first time that I put my handprint down in this big paw print. I'm like, this is cool. Like this, like there was a lot of respect, just immediate respect for this. I mean, at the time it's almost like this, uh, this mystical creature. You know what I'm saying? It's like, this this thing's out here somewhere. Yeah, this I, is real. Yeah. Whatever he is. Oh, this is real. Yeah, and it's like, I got a lot of respect for you, dude. Like, because clearly you could take me, no question. Yeah. <laughs> it's not even an issue, you know? Yeah. So so we cut that first track, and, uh, and so we're just hauling. Immediately we cut a big track, and they know it's a big track, so now it's just balls to the walls, and they've got it floored, and we're flying through the woods and, and going through some open space. And whenever we hit the open spots, I don't, I don't know how fast those snowmobiles could go, but we're going as fast as a snowmobile can go. I don't know if we're doing 60. We're going fast. We're going as fast as those suckers can go in the wide open. And then, of course, we get in some timber, and then they got to slow down, but they're still they're weaving in and out of trees, and they're going as fast as you can go without killing somebody. And even then, uh, it was day three, I think, I got smoked in the forehead with a with a tree limb, about knocked me off. And I was like, oh, I did this number. The luck that's holding on with both hands and had a big old red mark on my forehead and just, just missed my goggles. And so that it was, you got to have, have a, you had to have your head on the swivel because they weren't slowing down for nothing, you know. And, uh, so yeah, so we're weaving in and out of trees and and uh, just trying to stay on this track and not lose this track and catch up to this bear because we don't know how long ago the track was left and and he's and he's telling me he said he's he's doing he's doing this number like you look you look because he his job was to not kill us and his job was to go as fast as he could go without hitting a tree and not losing those tracks so his head's down following the tracks and his head's looking for trees not to hit right here in front of us and so I'm on the back hanging and I'm looking to my left and looking to my right looking for a bear. And so, and it was, man, it was so intense because you would come up, you'd come up on these little hills, these, you know, as you're going up the mountain, you'd come up on a little ridge or whatever, and you're just sitting there thinking like, oh man, he, he could be over this next ridge, like he could be right here. Yeah. And so literally we come up over the ridge and you're like, uh, oh, okay, he's not here, he's not here, he's not here. And then, so then you're going, you're going, you're going, and then you come up on another little, and, and dude, your heart was just every time like dude the anticipate like the roller coaster was just uh okay he's not there oh oh he's not and, and man <laughs> wow. it just added to the intensity of this oh it, it was it was incredible it was it wow. was that just added to it and i'm just thinking like if we were glassing it wouldn't be it wouldn't be nearly as cool you yeah. know what i'm saying like it's one of those deals where it's like okay we see him a thousand yards and he's over there on that other mountain you know and so so your heart has time to catch up with it before you get to him you know but but this deal of weaving in and out of these trees and coming up over these little ridges, like your heart was just like, oh, okay, okay, he's not here, he's not here. And and partly too, it's like, what if what if we, because there were times where we were, the snowmobile was literally on the track. Like sometimes it'd be off to the right, sometimes it'd be off to the left, but then there were times where we're right on the track. And I'm like, what if we come up over one of these little ridges and we run right into his butt? <laughs> like, what do you do? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, you don't have your gun out. My bow's on a sled, three, three sleds behind us. Like, <laughs> we're screwed. Like, no, what so are we going to do? <laughs> it was the ultimate. Oh, dude. It was the ultimate rush. Like, it was the coolest thing in the world. And so, so the, the other thing I won't forget, there's about three things that, well, there's a lot that I won't forget. But, but just as far as just sheer adrenaline rush like nobody's business so again we're, we probably follow these tracks for 45 minutes and eventually you start to get to the point where it's like okay he's probably not over this next ridge and so your your anticipation's dropping a little bit but it, but that's just it it's when you start to get comfortable that's when you probably that's probably when it's going to happen so you you almost couldn't allow yourself to get comfortable but but I was starting to get a little bit comfortable with like, okay, it, it's going to be a while before we find the spare. You know, we kept coming up over ridges and we're on this track for 45 minutes. And, and so, but again, I'm just still looking, I'm like, just kind of just enjoying the ride. And it was still fun riding these snowmobiles. And so I'm looking and uh, looking over to my ride and we come up over another little ridge. And I'm like, oh, is he at? No, uh, he's not over here. And then I look to my left and that bear is 30 yards from us. And he's paralleling us running the same speed we're going. Oh my. And I, Oh, dude, my heart, it, it went from it went from being about normal to out my throat and out my mouth. Like, I'm just, and so I'm tapping, bear, 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 you know? and then he's, oh, and, he, you know? and so he's trying to kind of get away from him because, like I said, he, and I, the most impressive thing was, is I'm like, 
that bear's going as fast as we are. Yeah. Like, and I'm thinking, dude, you better have your A game because if we hit a tree, we're screwed. Yeah. Because it was now in the wide open, absolutely we could outrun those bears without without question. I wasn't concerned at all. But in the trees where you're weaving and out, I'm thinking, dude, he he's in stride with us right now. Like yeah. literally he is, you know, he was 30 yards to our left and that bear is going at the same speed we're going. And I'm just sitting like, holy cow, like, is this a good idea to be bringing a bow in here? This is stupid. Like, what, what was I thinking? And and it so that rush, I don't know as if I'll ever compete with that. I mean, I now I did, the, you know, coming up here on the same trip. But as far as like whitetails, I don't, I don't, I just don't think I can ever reach that again. No, that's, that's a tails. whole nother different, like, different deal. Oh, it, it was, dude, you've got to do it. I, mean, I don't care who you are. You've <laughs> got to do this. It's, it's worth it. It's worth it. So, so now luckily he was, he was an eight foot. So they, they said eight foot, eight foot, eight foot, you know, not, not big bear, not big bear. I mean, to me, I'm thinking he's a freaking giant. Yeah. Like, I just shot, I wouldn't know any different. You know, I'd be like, I'd shot him, you know? And, uh, but luckily, and I say luckily, he was only an eight-footer because if I'm being honest, I don't think I could have got my composure together to sh- to make a good shot. I oh, think yeah. I'd have been shaking and my air had been tinking and, you know, because it was, it was just one of those things like it just happened so fast and we were we were immediately that close that quickly that my my, my heart's just, yeah, it just exploded. I'm, <laughs> it'd have been different, like I said, if I could have seen him out there at a thousand yards and okay. And now, and I, and we're talking about a game plan. It's like, okay, so I, I have an idea of what's going to happen and, and how we're going to approach this and how we're going to, you know, put the stock on whatever. But on this deal, I'm just like, I, I, what, what do we do? Do we just shoot him right here off the snow? <laughs> how, yeah. does, how does this work? Yeah. Like, what, you, you know, like, dude, I'd lost. No, I could have done it. I could have done it. No, it wouldn't <laughs> happen. I like to think that I'm calm and collect, but no, that first one, I don't, I don't think I could have done it. Like, we, we would have had to have like driven away from the bear where we couldn't see him whatsoever and then like okay you guys calm me down calm me down like okay okay i know that guy's in there man he was really big you know like right. okay, now let's like that's what we would have had to have done you know yeah <laughs> so so luckily he was only eight foot so we didn't go after him so we just left him alone i got some video of him whatever and uh so that that was pretty much like the first three and a half days and uh, we ended up cutting another track of another one and same deal only an eight footer um, we ended up cutting a track of a, and it was the biggest tracks we saw the whole trip. And dude, this, I would have loved to have at least seen that bear. Even, even if I wouldn't have had the opportunity to shoot him, I would have loved to have just seen him because that there, there was the biggest set of tracks that we'd saw the whole trip. And of course, and we, we were on him. I mean, we were cutting his tracks and we're going, and he's taking us up further and further. Well, and if I can say he's taking us up. For all I know, he was just walking the day before and he was just going back to his place where he hibernated or something. I don't know. Right. You know? But, uh, so, but anyways, we're going up this mountain and it's, like I said, so it was raining at the lower elevations and we're getting higher up and it's snowing and it's, and he's, he's like, no, no, not safe, not safe. Like basically there's a blizzard happening at the higher elevation. He's like, we, no, we can't go. We can't, we have to leave this bear. And so we had to leave him be. And I was kind of bummed like, oh man, like those tracks are big. Like, like that was the biggest we had seen up to that point. And those were the biggest we had seen the whole trip. Um, so we had to let him go. Another one, we cut some tracks. And uh, he ended up going down into a big steep canyon that we couldn't get down into. And if we could have got down into it, there's no way we were getting back up out of it with the snowmobiles. Like there's, there's just no way. So we couldn't, yeah. we had to let him go. Um, so then fast forward to, to day five. Oh, oh wait, no. So, so Dean shot, so Dean, Dean got a rifle and I told him, so it was raining the first three and a half days. And I said, Dean, I said, I really, I really want to try to get mine on film. I said, so, and this rain isn't the best for footage and it's not the best for my camera anyways. I said, so, and he was, like I said, this was his last hunt. And I'm like, you got first dibs, man. Like if we see a shooter and it's raining, you got first dibs. Yeah. You know, he's got the rifle, so it's going to be a little easier anyways. <clears throat> and uh, so that was, I think it was day three. And uh, this is another time I, I won't forget. <laughs> this is intense. So we end up, they end up spotting one. And uh, so Dean, he's on a, he's on a sled. He's on the back on the back snowmobile and uh so sure enough they get they kind of wheel dean around and the bear doesn't know we're there and and they end up he rolls off the sled you know and they're getting him the gun and and it was probably 150 yards they end up getting on this bear and, and uh he shoots and you can hear it hit the bear now i couldn't i couldn't see where it was and, and now again i'm still this is keep in mind this is this this would have been the third bear that we saw as far as like on foot you know 
So I'm still, I'm not thinking like I've got to film this. I'm think I'm just, I'm just caught up in the experience of it. I was like, Oh my gosh, that's a giant. And they're telling me this is a shooter. And I'm like, yeah, he's bigger than the other two that we saw. Like that's a, like he's big. And so I'm just, I didn't have my phone out. I'm just lost in the moment of this. Yeah. And, uh, so sure enough, he's get he's got the rifle and he shoots. You hear it hitting, and the bear turns and 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 I'm like, just hearing that roar, I'm like, dude, there is some power in that sucker. Like I I hope he doesn't know where we're at, you know. Yeah. And uh, so then Dean shoots again. You hear it hitting, and then that sucker turns and he looks and he sees us. And now there was a set of of pine trees. Now keep in mind these pine trees. I don't know. They were probably. I'd say these pine trees were probably 12 foot tall, anywhere from six to 12 foot tall, but the snow, they had snowed so much that it had weighted them down. So they were kind of, a lot of them were just kind of bent over. Um, but there were still a lot of these pines that were over top of your head. Cause eventually later we ended up walking into these pines and I'm like, man, these suckers are over. And you can, you can tell they were, they were tall cause we were on the outskirts on the edges of these. Cause right. these, this wasn't something that you drive in with a snowmobile. They were just, it wasn't something you'd really drive into. And, uh, so we we went out around these actually ended up to shoot the bear and so we had a this group of pines between us and the bear well this bear starts coming at us now and he gets into these pines and i'm not making this up and i wish i for the life of me i wish that i had my phone out and filmed this because this is something you just have to see it's literally the crap you see in the movies like think of a lion coming through grass and that grass is just parting as that sucker's just like it's the stuff you see in the movies yeah and these these aren't this isn't grass these are pine trees. Like these now they're they're not giant pine trees, but they're still trees. And these suckers are parting as this sucker is coming at us. And you can't see the bear. All you can see are these trees just as he's just coming. It's like, oh crap. Like he's he's coming at he's coming at us. Like we're we're screwed. And and so now at this point, everybody's standing up on the snowmobiles. And keep in mind, oh, so so he'd already so he'd shot three times before he got to the pines. One of them ricocheted off of his face. Now, we didn't know what it ricocheted off of at the time, but you heard him shoot, and it went, and I'm like, oh, crap, that ricocheted off of him. Like, that didn't even penetrate him. Like, wow. and again, oh, it just reminds you of of what you're dealing with. This isn't a deer. This isn't, this is a, this is a freaking Volkswagen coming at you. You know what I'm saying? And he's yeah. got claws and teeth, and he's going to kill you. Like, and when you heard that thing, when I heard that thing ricocheting, I was just like, oh, great. He's shooting a freaking gun and it's ricocheting. Like, <laughs> what's an arrow gonna do? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, and I even got my bow out, and so I'm like, we're screwed. We're screwed. Like, this is where I die. And so this thing's it hits these pines, and so it, and it's crazy how quickly your mind adrenaline can just take your mind and you're going through a million miles an hour and you're you're processing a million thoughts like in a split second. And so I'm looking at the pines. I'm like, okay, there's about a 30 yard gap between us and the pines. So as soon as he pops out of these pines, he's gonna be at 30 yards. And so I'm like, man, I hope these dudes, and I'm thinking that he's, so Dean's shooting this old Russian, so they all got like these old Russian Soviet army type guns, you know, and like, in my mind, I'm like, I'm looking at these, I'm like, are they on? Are they even on? Like, do we even know if these, has, did anybody shoot these guns before we went out? You know, like, this is what I'm looking at my head, like, do we even know if these are on? Like, like, do you even have the right bullets? Like, what's, what's going on here? You know, like, Just... I wish we'd have shot these before we left. Like, why didn't we shoot these before we left? Like, are we sure? Yeah, so like, my mind's <laughs> Your going mind's crazy. Your mind's just going crazy. Oh, this, dude, this, this whole time, and the bear's just coming out, and you just see these these pine trees just just parting as the sucker's coming and so by now we're all standing up on top of the snowmobiles trying to see down into these pines and they're all doing this and it's like you know they got their heads up like looking like waiting to maybe he'll get to an opening or something and it ain't happening and so in my mind right or wrong this is what i rationalized <laughs> i'm looking i'm like I guess I'll just, so they had these sleds that one was carrying Dean. They had a big sled that they'd pull behind the snowmobiles. One was carrying Dean, and then they had another one that was carrying my bow and then also some gasoline because um, we were putting on a lot of miles, so they have to refill. So so I just, this is my thought. I look at this sled next to me. I'm like, well, I guess I'll just dive underneath the sled and dig a hole and throw the snow over top of me so he can't smell me. Like that that was my thinking. I'm like, that's where I'm going. Like when this sucker pops out at 30 yards, I'm going underneath that sled. I'm digging a hole, throwing snow on top of me. He won't be able to smell me. I hope not anyways, <laughs> and, and that's how I'm going to survive this. Um, luckily, and like I said, dude, my mind, you're just a million thoughts yeah. in like that quick. So luckily, he stops at 60 yards. So you see these pines just the whole way to you, and then all of a sudden they stop. And it's like, did he die? What, what's happening? What's happening? Because you can't see him. Yeah. So it's like, maybe he just fell over dead. Maybe we're lucky. And dude, if there's ever going to be a poop in your pants moment, this was it. The sucker stood up. 
out of these pines and he looks to his right first and then he looks and he looked right at me and i'm just like i'm dead yeah i'm, I'm your dead. heart just like we so had high. we had a 30 minute conversation it, was, it wasn't 30 minutes but literally he and i had a 30 minute conversation and he did all the talking and i did all the listening and he basically told me i'm coming for you and you're going to be dead and i was like i believe you i believe you <laughs> I'm dead. Yeah. Like we had that conversation and he was looking at me right in it's it's I know I was explaining to some guys the other day, I was like, it's like if you're I don't know if you've ever been in church or not, but you know, the preacher would be scanning the audience of like two thousand people. But he'll like talk on something and it's like, dude, dude, he looked right at me. Yeah, he I looked know at me. he looked right at me, <laughs> you know? Like that's what it was. Like we were a group of guys, there were six of us, and we were all pretty close together. But dude, I'm telling you, I'm tr- dude, I'm telling you. He looked right at me, and he looked right in my eyes, and he told me, I'm coming for you, and I'm going to kill you. And I said, I believe you. I believe you. Like, okay. All right. Wow. And then, but then, boom, boom, they put two in his chest, and then dropped him. I was like, oh, okay, because I thought I was dead. Like, I, and I knew I was dead, you know? <laughs> and so That is insane. That moment of him, I, I'll never forget. And I again, I wished, I was just, I was so lost in the moment, and just the experience of it, like, I, I wish I wish I had brought a cameraman with me. I wish I had spent the extra money for the plane flight and all that I needed to do to bring the cameraman, and, and maybe we'd have gotten on footage. Because just to see the 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 trees parting and then they stop, like it's the crap you see in the movies. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and then all of a sudden the sucker when that sucker stood up though, because you knew that because we were driving right by these trees when we were trying to get on him. It's like these things are taller than us, and when that sucker stood up, he's head and shoulders above these. Wow. And it's it was just oh my goodness. It was just again it's, it's I should I be should I really be trying to kill one of these with a bow? And not to mention the fact that the something ricocheted off you know, the bullet ricocheted off of some part of his body and then later found out we end up going in you know, they, they end up killing, we end up going in there and sure enough, come find out, ricocheted off of his face. That Went is right crazy. off of his nose, right off of his cheekbone. Wow. Yeah. And so I'm just like, what am I doing with a bow? Like, should I really be doing this a bow? Like, maybe my wife was right. Maybe I should have stayed home. Maybe I am going to die. Maybe my boys are going to grow up without a father. Like, this is this is where oh, I die, man. you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but, but to see that sucker stand up was one of the coolest, most awe-inspiring things. Like, there was, there was reverence. There was power. There was uh, all of that wrapped up into just that moment of him. The, the pine stopped moving. There was like a calm... And then all of a sudden, this freaking giant just raises up, looks to his right, looks to his looks at, right at us, squares us up, and centers me up. And I'm like, it, it like like the world paused. The yeah. world paused in that moment, and we had a 30 minute conversation. And he said, "I'm coming for you. I'm going to kill you, and your kids aren't, aren't going to have a dad." And I'm like, "I believe you." Okay, like I had already come to grips with that's that's where I die. Wow. And oh, man. and then all of a sudden, boom, boom, to the chest, and then he drops. I'm like. Oh, okay. I think I'm. I think I'm gonna be okay. Literally like a movie. <laughs> it was, Holy cow! It was cow. crazy. It was crazy. Wow. Yeah. Golly. Sorry. Sorry. No, you're good. So, you're you you've talked about several times about how you know these. You're just you're taken back by the the size and the just these beasts of creatures that these bears are, and you know second guessing your archery choice. Um, oh yeah. What yeah. what kind of what kind of arrow setup are you running in preparation for a hunt like this? That, and and I'm yeah, I'm a bow so, only guy too, so I'm I'm also just curious from that aspect. But yeah, yeah. So so I've got a Hoyt bow. Um, the arrows that I'm shooting, and I've shot these. This is what I shoot at Whitetails. I'm yeah. not, it's not like I switch switch anything up. Now it is a heavier arrow arrow, but it's a it's an Easton FMJ. It's a okay. full metal yeah. jacket, so it's a in a a carbon arrow wrapped with aluminum is what it is, and so they are a heavier arrow. Um, and then on, on the tip of that, I've got a sever broadhead, but I'm shooting, you know, they've got a, a 1.5, I think they've got a 1.75 inch, and they've got a two inch cutting diameter. And I I like the larger cutting diameter. Like I've had no issues with penetration. Um, and maybe it's because I'm shooting that heavier FMJ arrow. Um, but all my deer, with the exception of maybe one or two where I've hit like the opposite shoulder, you know, um, you know, if they got like a quarter and away shot or something, um, yeah, I mean, all my deer, literally, I'm burying that arrow in the dirt on the other side. You know, I get a complete pass yeah. through barrows. Yeah. Um, and when I ended up shooting my bear, then on day five, like, it was the same thing. Now, he was quartered away. Now, granted, he was at 10 yards, so I, it was a close shot. It wasn't like I was shooting him out there at 60. Um, but there's no doubt in my mind that I would have had a, a complete pass through 
had it not hit the opposite shoulder. So he was he was kind of walking away a little bit, quarter, kind of quartered away. Um, and my arrow went right up through him, shooting for the opposite shoulder like you're supposed to. And again, it hit that opposite shoulder. And, but I was buried up to the fletchings. And I'm like, yeah, it, it would have got a complete pass through had I not. If he'd have been broadside, perfectly broadside, you know, I wouldn't have, wasn't shooting for that opposite shoulder. Yeah, I'd have got a complete pass through, no question. Gotcha. Um, so, and and what's crazy is, and I, I don't I don't know, I mean, like I'm I'm pretty confident that a rifle is more lethal. Like I'm I'm pretty pretty sure that's the case, but for whatever reason, my arrow, my bear didn't go 15 yards, and then he piled up. Oh wow. And I and I gave Dean a hard time. I'm like, yeah, here you got to put. So he shot he shot his bear eight times. Oh wow! They put eight bullet they put eight bullets in that bear. Yeah. Holy and I'm Christ. like, all I needed was one arrow. I mean, I think it's just a matter of placement. And again, we talked afterwards, and I'm like, did you like Dean? Why didn't you shoot that gun before we went out? Like, how do you know if it was on? Like, maybe it wasn't on. You know, like. I mean, I, we could hear it hit, but I didn't have my binoculars up. Like, like I said, I was just lost in the moment. Yeah. So I don't know. We don't, you know, you don't know where it hit until after the fact, and then you're looking at bullet holes and you're looking at his hide, and there's a caping mount. You know, you're able to count bullet holes and figure, okay, this is an entrance, this is an exit, and you know, you're doing the math. And it's like, okay, we put eight bullets in this sucker, not counting the one that ricocheted off of his face, so nine total. Wow. You know. And uh, but yeah, my I had one arrow, and yeah, he went 15 yards, and I. You know, maybe maybe the bear was already ready to die. I don't know. Maybe he was. Maybe he was just an old. And now he, they did say he was a really old bear because they look at their teeth. You know, and his teeth are just gnarled down. And um, so maybe maybe I just got a bear that was like super old, and he was like going to die in the next couple of days, anyways. You know, I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe that's why he only went fifteen yards. Yeah. But are th- yeah are these are these guys up there the these Russians are they looking at you like you're crazy for bringing a bow up there, or do they get bow hunters? Fairly regularly. No, so, yeah, so they, they get bow hunters. I wasn't I wasn't the first one I've taken. I know I won't be the last either. Um, a guy, in fact, a guy reached out to me on Instagram afterwards, um, and we did some talking. He said, "Hey, you know, who did you go with? Whatever." And we talked, and he told me who he went with, and I'm like, "Yeah, that's the same guy. Like, you're gonna be fine." Um, and so, yeah, I have I need to I need to catch. I don't I forgot who he is. I get a lot of messages, so I don't. I, he's probably lost in my messages somewhere. But um, I hope if you're listening, man, send me a message. Let me know how you did. If you got one or not, but. Uh, um, yeah, so I wasn't, I know I wasn't there first, um, cause I'd even seen several in the midst of research and outfitters, like, I'm like, okay, but how many guys have taken bow hunters? Cause there's a, you know, and, and you probably know it's like, there's, and I, I, I get it. I, I don't hold any grudges. Like there's a lot of outfitters that just hate bow hunters yeah. and it's, it's nothing personal, but it's obviously as an outfitter, what helps you sell hunts is is pictures of of success of yeah. showing success and obviously you have more success with a rifle than you do with a bow and so there's a lot of outfitters that hate bow hunters because it's like dude you're going to decrease my chances of of having success you know harvesting an animal um and so there's a lot of outfitters that don't like bow hunters uh, but these guys know they're like no come on come on you know and i was like okay let's go cool. um yeah so it was i i there's no i mean if i go back again lord willing i i will um, I'm going with the same group, no question. Same group of guys. Yeah. So they 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 got their stuff together and they know what they're doing. Awesome. So, well, that's yeah, very yeah. cool. Well, man, you've you've given me some some sneak peeks talking about ten yards and the quarter and shot oh, yeah, and all yeah. this kind of stuff. Let me hear about your bear and how all that went down. So yeah, so so fast forward to day five. We wake up day five and so well day four though, um, we had we had cut some tracks. Um, we never. I don't think we even saw a bear on day four. The weather, but the weather was just starting to kind of let up a little bit on day four, and uh, but we ended up seeing a mama bear and two cubs. That was and we, that was just by accident. Like we're just going through the woods and we're actually working our way back to camp, and uh, we weren't even on a track or anything. We're just going through through the woods, and next thing I know, we do we just stop and they're like oh, oh, oh and we look and there was a mama bear with two little cubs and they had they they were coming up out of hibernation is what they said. Um, cause there were no tracks at all of this mama bear and two cubs. Like she literally, they're literally just waking up and they're deciding to get out for the first time. And so they're basically by this tree, what they, they don't really, we didn't, I never saw any dens, you know, Tim, what I did see is, and I, again, I didn't get pictures. I just, there's a lot of things I, I wish I had documented that I didn't. Um, but what they would do is they'd find like these trees. Sometimes there'd be like a, a whole mixture of trees together and they would just kind of like dig a small hole, like large enough for their body, basically, kind of in the midst of these trees. 
and that's where they would just hibernate. And I guess they just let the snow blow over top of them and, and then maybe dig a hole out in the midst of the snow. I don't know. But huh. uh, that's what we were seeing whenever we would see, like he'd point like, like, and he would say bed or sleep or something. Like basically that's where they hibernate. Um, so I'm like, oh, okay, wow, that's, that's cool. Like it wasn't a cave or a den like you'd think of. Um, and so that's what this mama bear and her two cubs, and we figured they were just getting up out of hibernation and we we're sitting there filming it. And, and again, we're set, we're right there 35, 40 yards. And you hear all these stories of like mama bears and cubs, like you better stay away from them, you know? And I'm like, and I'm looking and everybody's got their phones out filming. And I'm like, and of course I got my phone out filming too. And I, and I actually did document that, but we're sitting there and I'm like, wait a second, nobody's got a gun. Like what if, what if mama bear decides <laughs> to charge us and thinks we're a threat to her cubs, you know? And, but luckily she didn't, and she just she just walked off on her way, and we just filmed her just walking off on her way. And, and dude, that was, again, it's part of the experience. Yeah. Like, there's so many cool things that I got to see and encounter that that I'm not going to ever get to see in Kansas, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, and, and all of that stuff, and that's what I was telling Dean. I said, you know, I said, I'm kind of glad that we had bad weather for the first three and a half days because it made – it made it hard for us to find bears just because, and that's what he told us. He said, it, it's going to be rough because whenever the weather's bad, typically they like to bed up and sleep. Um, and it's like a human being. They'll look out the window and be like, ah, oh, it's raining today. Eh, I'm just going to go back to bed. So one, you're not going to see a lot of bears because they're sleeping. And two, you're not going to see a lot of tracks because they're sleeping. Um, so he told us it's going to be rough. Um, but like I told him, I said, you know, I'm kind of glad the weather was bad for the first three and a half days because look at everything else that we got to experience. Yeah. Like, now, now, granted, I would have been bummed had I not killed one. Don't get me wrong; like I would have been bummed. I'd rather, I'd rather kill on day one rather than never kill at all. You know, like right. I still want to have success because that's you're spending that kind of money. It's like you kind of want to, you want to come home with something, you know, uh, more than just what you bought at the airport, you know. Yeah. So, so anyways, we saw the mama bear, two cubs, and we were leaving them, and we're we we're just passing. You know, we let them walk off on their way, then we're leaving them, and we in the midst, we were probably eight hundred to a thousand yards kind of headed back to camp and again we're we're still probably i don't know we're probably an hour and a half away from camp um but sure enough we cut some big tracks and we're literally 800 to 1000 yards away from where we just saw the mama bear and our two cubs and so we're getting on these tracks and we're trying to get on but then he's like look and he's like ah we, we don't have time like we're starting to lose light he's like there's no way we have time to go after this bear and still make it back before we lose light you know and and they're not wanting to get stuck out here in the dark either right and so it's like we, you know, morning, morning, we come back, morning, we come back, you know, it's like, okay, you know, so, so we get back to camp and then we end up eating dinner that night and, and we were, you know, talking and, and he was saying like, basically we're going to kill that bear. Like, and, and I knew this too, like, so, you know, maybe a lot of people don't know this, but the, the big males, the big boars, they will actually kill the cubs and they'll kill the cubs because then when they kill the cubs, the mama bear, the sow will come back into heat and then they're able to breed her again. So if her cubs are still alive, the mama bear's not in, she won't be in heat that at all that year. Yeah. Um, she'll raise those cubs, like that's her job, she'll raise those cubs, she's not in heat again. But if, if a, and again, those big males, those big boars will come in there and they'll kill the cubs, and then that way, just it's just nature's way of, of repopulating itself, she'll automatically come back into heat again and then he's able to breed her. So he's like, we're killing that bear. Like tomorrow we kill bear. Like he, he's like, no, he'll kill cubs, no, we're gonna let cubs live. We kill that bear. Like he was dead set. Let's kill this bear. I'm like, dude, I'm all for it. Like, yeah, let's, let's go. go. Like, I don't care. Like, let's go. Like, you tell me, let's let's go. So I don't care if he's eight footer, ten footer. I don't care. Let's go. Like, I'm I'm on board with you. You know, like, yeah, just seeing those cubs. Like, it was, dude, it was so cool. I wish I had my my big picture camera because I could have got. I had a, a calendar moment where literally the two cubs were underneath of her, and literally mama bear looks at me and both cubs look up at us and I'm like. Oh, dude, there's my moment where I can snap some pictures and that, dude, that's that's your calendar shot. Like, yeah. oh, it was, it was the coolest thing. So sure enough, we wake up the next morning. It's like, you know, and he points in the direction of where we saw the mama bear and where we saw the last saw those tracks. He's like, we go, we kill bear, we kill bear. I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm on board. I already told you, let's go, you yeah. know. So sure enough, we head on out and on the midst, and we had a wait. We still had a ways to go to get there, but uh, so on the way out there, we ended up seeing a fox. And I did get footage of him. I got my phone out real quick and filmed him. Again, it looks like the same fox that we have here in the states. Um, and so I was like, this is cool, you know? And so we just sat there and we, everybody stopped for it. And again, it, they're no different than us. Like they, they're they still, and they're out there in these woods every day, but it's like, they're still just soaking up nature. Yeah. You know, so sure enough, we see this fox and everybody stopped, you know, all four snowmobiles stop and everybody gets their phones out. It's like, dude, we're all, we're all the same. Even though we're from different parts of the world, we speak different languages. It's like, 
these are my people. You know what I'm saying? Like they love nature just as much as I love nature. They want to see the mama bear and the cubs just as much as I do. They want to see this fox just as much as I do. And, and, and again, no bullets are flying. No arrows are flying. We're not killing anything. We're just enjoying the moment. We're just living in the moment and just the experience, you know? I'm like, yeah. this is this is cool. Like, this is where I'm at. And it, there was something about day five that I'm just like, I just felt at peace. I think even if I didn't kill one, I was just like, you know what? Even if I don't kill one, like, this has been the coolest trip ever. Like, yeah. and I'm coming back. Regardless, I'm coming back. You know, like, this is just, this has been a blast. And so, um, so we left the Fox. We're, we're going back. And sure enough, we ended up cutting tracks. And we we got back on the tracks where we last saw him. Or last, not saw him, but last where we saw his tracks. Where we left his tracks the night before. And so the same thing. We're just, we're on the tracks. And we're visiting and out of the trees. And we get to some open spots. And we're going through some more trees again. We get to some we're crossing creeks. We're building bridges. And, and again, I'm just sitting there. I'm just like, this is cool. Like now, now the adrenaline isn't as much as it was on day one, as the first three days, you know, but now it's just like, this is cool. Like we're stopping to uh, build a bridge. And so I get my phone out and they're building a bridge and I'm filming them build a bridge, you know? And, and uh, so we got to cross this Creek and then we build another one. So it was just, it was, all of this is cool. So sure enough, we're, we end up getting on the tracks and, and probably, it was probably 45 minutes to an hour. Um, of being on the tracks and sure enough we get to a part where you know we're looking up and he's probably 200 yards ahead and he doesn't know we're here and we sure enough we come up over and he's kind of down this oh this i don't know i wouldn't really say it was a canyon but it was just like a long strip with no trees it was it was maybe a small it's like a small ditch or something in between yeah. kind of some hillsides and it's like oh wow that there he is like he's right up there and so we all just you know everybody just stops and shuts snowmobiles off and we're just sitting there they pull up the binoculars and they're looking at him like okay is he a big one you know whatever and sure enough, they're like, shooter. And when, dude, when, when they, so keep in mind, by this point now, we had we had seen quite a few bears now because the weather had started letting up, and and so we had seen quite a few bears. Uh, we had we had a point where we glassed the day before. Uh, we saw we did yeah we did see some bears on day four, um, but but they were they were smaller bears and they wanted nine foot plus is what they're going for you know, and uh, so. By this point, we hadn't seen quite a few bears, and so I'm just like, I'm not getting my hopes up. I'm just like, this is cool. Like, that's a big bear. I don't know how, you know, I don't know if he's an eight footer or a nine footer or what he is, but it's a big bear to me. And I'm like, yeah. so I'm just soaking. I'm like, that's cool. But then all of a sudden, you know, there after a little bit, I'm just looking at him. They're like, he looks at me. He says, "Big bear, shooter, shooter." And I was like, okay, <laughs> okay. So now, like, now my heart's in. Like now my heart's racing. It's like, okay, it's go time. It's go time. Like what? What are we doing? What are we doing? Like you tell me what we're doing. You know. And so they're like, you you get back to sled. You know. So they they're pointing back to the sled. So I go back to the sled where my bow is. So I get on the sled with my bow. Basically, what they do is they then I'm on the sled and, and we take a big loop around this sucker. They again, all these guys, they all have GPSs on their on their snowmobiles and they they know this country like the back of their hand. So we're taking a big loop around this sucker, and, and I'm like, okay, I think I know what's happening. Like, they're, we're making a big loop around. Because we saw, you know, as we were watching him for a while, we saw the kind of the general direction that he's already headed on his own, you know. So we make a big loop around, and I don't know how far we went. I bet. Oh, we went a ways. Um, end up getting somewhere in front of the bear, shut the snowmobile off, end up walking in there, getting in some trees, getting by a tree, whatever, finding a good location, and... I, I'm assuming what the the other two guys on the snowmobiles were doing that was just kind of just slowly easing in. They they again they've got radio, so they were radio. I don't speak Russian, so I don't know what was happening. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what was happening, but I'm assuming they they were probably bumping that bear to us just slowly. But they didn't want him to run because these suckers could run. I bet they were going. I bet they could go 30 miles an hour. Oh I yeah, mean, they could they could flat haul. Um, so you definitely don't want to pressure this sucker and get the sucker running where you, you know, there's no way I can pull this off with a bow if they're running that fast. So long story short, we're sitting there and you're just waiting. It's like, and you're looking through the trees and, and it's like, you know, he's here. Like you, you've done seeing him, you know, he's here and you know, he was headed in the direction that we have now got in front of him. And so at some point he's going to show up now. I don't know where, you know, and then sure enough, you end up seeing him come through the trees and now it's like, and now your heart's racing again. Like it's, it's like, and now I've got my bow in my hands and arrows knocked like this. And I'm the one shooting now. It's not needed anymore. It's me. And it's like, this is this might go down like this this might actually yeah. go down like and so you're again you're you can run a million thoughts through your head all at once and uh, sure enough the sucker's coming in and uh it ended up being a, a 10 yard quarter away shot smoked him he goes 15 yards and just piles up and i'm just like it just it's it's i'll be honest it still doesn't feel real like yeah. i don't i don't think it's still going to register until he's he's standing up in my house like 
it was number one on my list. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like this stuff doesn't happen. I'm a kid from a small town in Kansas. I grew up in a in a small town of 500 people. I graduated with like 12 kids. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like this stuff doesn't, it's not supposed to happen to me. Right. You know, I didn't grow up in a rich family. I didn't, you know what I'm saying? I'm just like, it was a culmination of, of events and, of, of crossing bridges and snow bridges and hand built bridges and, and fixing so many different parts on snowmobiles and getting stuck in rivers. Yeah, we got stuck in the river one time. And so we got to get like 100 feet of rope and we're getting these pulling these snowmobiles out of the river. And I mean, like, literally, all of these thoughts are just going through my head. And I'm like, I, I'm just like, I was all like, literally, I was already happy with, with if just going home, we'd be handed. Like, because I had experienced all of this stuff. And I'm like, I did it. I actually did. Yeah. Like, I don't even know how to process what's happening right now. Like, and there he is laying there, like, hands down, hands down, take my money. I'm going again. No question. <laughs> wow. Best adventure to date. Holy cow, man. So, so 10 yards, he runs 15 yards. You, you talked about him coming through the trees. How far was he when you first <laughs> saw him? And, and did he know y'all were there? Was, <laughs> were you just that close to where he was walking? So I don't, I don't know. I don't think he knew where we were. Um, so when I first saw him, he was probably, so there was a lot of thick, um, so, the, and I don't know what kind of trees they are. They look like Aspen trees. They look like they had, I mean, they had all kinds of different trees, but the ones where I end up shooting him and that's where the picture is. That's where he laid. Um, it looks, they look like Aspen trees. Like you'd see in Colorado. I don't know what kind of tree they are, but they look like Aspen trees. So they had those Aspen trees, but before that, there was a lot of these little, it almost looks like buck brush. I mean, we call it like buck brush. You're like just a lot of little trees that are all stacked together. So you couldn't really see, you couldn't have shot through it. There's no way you could have shot an arrow through it. Um, probably not. It wouldn't even be good to shoot a rifle through it, but that's where he ended up coming through. And so we're sitting there and, and I've got, you know, a guy with a gun there with me and we're sitting there and I'm, and I'm looking and excuse me. And you hear some snow crunch. It's like, and so now it's like, and I'm like, bear, bear, like there he is, but he's in the thick stuff where you, it's like, there's no way we can shoot him. And sure enough, he ends up getting out of the thick stuff. And now we're kind of in like these these aspen trees that are spread out more, you know, a little further from each other. And it's like, okay, I mean, clearly this is where we're going to shoot him. And that's where we were set up for. And uh, and he looked at us. And I don't know if, I don't, I'm guessing that we were there. You know, I don't know. But at this point, it's like, here we are. Yeah. Like, I don't know if they weren't. See, but, see, but again, the mama bear, see, we were really close to the mama bear. We were really close to another bear that was an eight footer. Um, I don't. I don't think they see a lot of people. I don't think they're that. I just don't think they're afraid of you. Huh? Like, I don't think they care. Yeah. And, and again, you, you got to keep in mind, they don't have any predators. True. You know what I'm saying? Like, who's going to eat them? You know, it's not like they're, it's not like they're a little rabbit. And it's oh, like, yeah. oh man, I've got to be constantly looking out for my life, you know? No, so I mean, he looked at us and he saw us yeah. like, and the snowmobile's not too far from us it's like you can clearly see the red snowmobile like if you can't see us in camo you can surely see the red snowmobile you know <laughs> like so he had to have seen us i just don't know if he just didn't care what and then just kind of just walked on past and quartered away 10 yards like that was easy like after seeing dean's ordeal with the bear charges like it was almost like god's like here you go and like i said maybe he was maybe he was on the tail end of dying <laughs> i don't know maybe it's just an old bear he's like yeah I was going to die this year anyways. It was a rough winter. And, you know, I don't know. Wow. I don't know. Oh, man. So it, it was. And the worst part about the whole thing, and this is just a kick in the nuts. Like, so I love filming everything and, and doing big films, whatever. Now, we end up, we got some footage on a, on a cell phone. It was filmed on a cell phone. We'll, we'll see what we can. I haven't even looked at the footage yet. I've, I've imported it all into my computer. Um but when I looked, I saw that it was being filmed with a cell phone. And I was just like, did we not get my big camera out? Like, why Why have we been hauling this tripod and my big camera around everywhere we go if we weren't? They knew I wanted this film. And, and it was already talked about who, which one of the guys was going to film it, you know? And, yeah. and But again, I'm just, I got lost in the moment. Like, it was partly my fault. I got lost in the moment, too, because it's like, there he is. And I'm not thinking film and then after it happens then I'm looking at them like where's the big camera where's the big camera and tripod like we had time to do that we could have we could have done this we could have pulled this off yeah. but here's what I got is the phone I see the guy holding the phone I'm like is that it is that it but so then I, I had to I, I'll be honest I had to have a moment there where I sat there and I'm like you know what like I can't let the fact that 
this may not be the best footage or it may not even be good footage at all. Like we may, I don't know. Right. So I can't let that ruin the entire experience. Like this, so I, I have to get over, like as, as much as I was bummed that we didn't film it, like there was so much emotions. Like I can't even, I still can't process them. Like and here we are weeks later, you know, what? Not, not, not a month, oh yeah, maybe close to a month. Yeah, probably a month after I shot him. But like there were so many emotions of, there was there was some sadness of no no film. No, like that's what I'm saying. Like no film, no film, and and they're like, ah, oh, and, and then now they're realizing too. Like, oh yeah, we forgot to get the, <laughs> the big camera. Like, yeah. oh yeah, like, but again, they're these these guys are Russian outfitters. Like, they don't film. That's not what they do. Their right. job is to get you on a big bear, and they did their job. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. I'm like at the end of the day, they did their job. Like. So I can't, you know. So and I, I know, I know. Like, the ex- I can't let that ruin. Yeah, the I know the exact feeling that that you have, and I'm not trying. <laughs> like, I, I don't know if any experience would compare to the story that you that you just told and the experience you just had. But, um, you know, I, I mentioned before we started recording that last year I had the opportunity to go to Colorado on my first ever mule deer hunt, and I'm bow only too, so I'm doing it archery in flat country, spot yeah. and stock, and same deal when it came down to it and down to this pretty complicated stock to try to make a move on this buck it was like my my help my the other guys that could have filmed it they're every bit of a half mile away if not longer yeah so they're not really set up for it i i have a bow mounted camera that is in my bag on my back that i completely forgot about <laughs> until after i got done but yeah. i, I yeah. know i know the feeling right you make the shot and your excitement and as everything starts coming down you're like oh man i could have done that i could have gotten it on film right but, but you're 100 percent right you can't let it ruin the moment because yeah that no that that is it's everything that you that you dreamed of you know and Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. F- footage is, footage is well, a bonus, yeah. you know. But the 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 experience, it, you can't match it. No, no. Well, and and you know, and, and I it was funny too. Later, I thought because there were so many moments throughout that that I didn't film. Like I said, the snow bridges, the bear charging us, the bear standing up. Like there's so much that I didn't capture. And. I, and maybe you've seen that meme, but there's a meme, and I'm not a, I'm not a golfer, but there's this there's this meme out there of this guy standing. I, I'm guessing it's like at the Masters, um, and everybody around this guy is like got their phones out, got their phones out, and there's this one guy like right in the middle of the picture. He's sitting there with his arms crossed, holding the beer in his hands, and he's just he's just watching it, no phone out. He is just fully soaking up the experience, and he's just logging it all yes. right here. You know, whereas other people, they're they're worried about am I getting good footage and they're doing this number. You know, they're going back and forth between the phone and the guy and the phone and the and the golfer and, but this guy, he's just like, a hundred percent, just there. He's he's logging it all up here. Yeah. Yep. And I and I thought, you know what? Like, screw it. I don't I don't care if if nobody else sees some of the stuff that I saw. I've got it up here. Yeah, I was there. And I can I pull those out it, of the yeah. archives anytime I want. Yeah, like. It, and it was my hunt and, and screw it. Like if I wasn't able to share everything about this and, and you're, you never are anyways. Like there's so much, even, even the stuff where I got the camera out 90% of the time, there's still even things that you don't capture because the bird flew in and before you get the camera out and hit record then the bird flew off or, you know, just little things, little things that you just, there's no way you could capture it all, you know? And so again, it's just, you're just making a mental note of those and, and you're just logging those in the archives and, yeah, I mean, I'll screw it. I'll be able to pull those out for as long as I live. I'll pull those out. Now, that brown bear standing up, I can still see it today in my mind just as clear as it was. Yeah. I mean, and I'll pull it out every so often. Like, man, that was really cool. Like when that bear stood up, that was – man, when that bear was charged, when I heard it ricochet, oh, my gosh, that was scary. Yeah. Like, I, screw it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that's why we do it. Like, that's why we do it. <clears throat> 100%. I couldn't agree more. How big did your bear end up being? So we didn't we didn't actually put a tape on him, but I know what my wingspan is, you know. So so we had we had had him laid out. In fact, later we they put him up on boards and they kind of they stood him up and we got pictures of the big volcano in the background. Um, so I stretched my arms out there and I'm you know I don't know if they just said carry a tape measure or what, um, but I I stretch my arms out there. I'm like okay, and then I I leave the one hand there and then I walk and I mark it and then I stretch out again. I'm like okay, how much further is it to go? You know, it's about this far and 
And so then I go the other way from the nose to the tail is how they measure them, you know, from the from the the one hand across to the other hand and then from the nose to the tail. And so then I did that and I'm like, he's something over nine foot. I don't know what exactly, but he's he's somewhere over nine foot. Wow. So I don't know if he's nine three, I don't know if he's nine six, you know, because then you gotta divide them by two and, and so I'm just ballparking. He's over nine. That's what I know. He's somewhere over nine. Yeah. So that's awesome. And you you <laughs> mentioned uh having him standing in your room there so you're getting a full body mount i guess that's so that's the plan we'll see <laughs> so it's it's expensive i mean oh, so, yeah. so and i've got the i've got the money to do it right now well i won't after i place this next bulk order of clothing um <laughs> so so this clothing deal this clothing thing has taken a lot of money like it's yeah. it has depleted the funds like i said we were in a position to buy some land and now we're not. So they can just give you an idea. It, it took a lot of money to start this. Um, and I, I really don't want to, I really want this clothing thing to take off. Like, cause I, I have thoroughly enjoyed the whole process of this clothing stuff. And I'm like, man, I'd really, I'd love to do this full time. Like it'd be a lot of fun. Um, so I really want to see that succeed. And so I'm not going to, I've got time. I've got, I've still got quite a bit of time. Um, I'm hoping that clothing sales will go phenomenal this fall. So we launched it in, in like January and right now is literally the worst time to sell clothing. Um, but even then we've sold out a lot of the larger sizes. And so I know that's hurt me too. Cause I know that I've had a lot of guys ask me like, Hey, when are you going to get the large puffy jackets? And when are you going to get the extra large puffy jackets? Or, and it's like, well, probably been July. Like that's right now we're hoping that's the turnaround time right now at the factory. Um, we're still figuring that stuff out as far as what that looks like and time frames to, you know, get product back at, you know, back in restock. And, and when do we order? You know, when do we order when we're down to three jackets? Do we do we restock then or do we order when we're down to 20 or, you know? Right. So just trying to figure out, you know, the logistics of all that and when we reorder stuff and restock. But um, so, yeah, I've got time. I'm probably going to have a year before I have to make the decision of, am I doing a full body mount? I want to do a full body mount. I, oh, yeah. I, I would like to, but you're looking at $7,000 for yeah. a full body mount. Yeah. And, and so it's like, yeah, I mean, and that's, you know, realistically, I could use that $7,000 to develop probably at least two, if not maybe three more pieces to the clothing line. You know, that could be three more jackets, three new, three new SKUs that we're adding. Um, and I'm like, man, I'd really like, so we'll see where we're at financially, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah I, I want to do a full body mount. I do. But, uh, but at the same token, like I told Mark, I said, man, I want to go back because I've seen a 10 footer. I've seen a 10 foot bear and I know how big those are. Yeah. And I'm like, I mean, if I'm going to have one standing up, do you want the nine footer or do you want the 10 footer? <laughs> yeah. I want the 10 footer. You yeah. know? So, Lord willing, I want to go back again. Um, and my beast is good for three years. So, Lord willing, I hopefully I can go back here. And like I said, I've just got to, I've just got to buckle down and get this clothing line and hopefully it, it does well and it takes off and, and get some money start coming in again. And, um, yeah, hopefully I can go again here soon and, and hopefully shoot a 10-footer. And then, then, yeah, it'll make my decision a lot easier. But. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Did you get to eat any of it? So, no. So so there's a, there's an old trapper there, boy, and I, I posted a picture of that guy. He That guy lives there year-round. Wow. Like... And I, and it's funny cause it's funny cause now he was, he kind of helped like, so he was like in charge of like cutting wood and keeping the, keeping the fire going, you know, and, um, making sure we never ran out of heat, whatever. But, uh, so he, he had some jobs while we were there. And so he did some work and I don't know what they pay him. Um, but yeah, he lives there year round. And it's funny cause Dean, Dean gave him a tip and I'm like, Dean, what's he going to do with that? Like it's, and, and it's American money, keep in mind. <laughs> it wasn't even Russian, but it's like, Dean, what? You know, like, I don't think that dude, I don't think that guy uses money. I really, because he literally lives off the land back there. Yeah. Like, that's, that's where the dude lives. He doesn't go into town. He, I didn't see any vehicles out there. And, well, there weren't any vehicles anyways because we took snowmobiles. Yeah. Now, he had some ratty tatty. I don't know if they worked. He, there were a couple snowmobiles that I think were his. Um, dude, they were rough. Like, I could, I could send you a picture. I don't know if I post, I don't think I posted those. Um, I didn't post those. There were two snowmobiles that were, I mean, like bare bones. And I'm like, that's, I think that's what the dude goes around on. Yeah. Like he checks his traps. He, you know, like this is, this is what the dude gets around on. He ain't going into town. Like he doesn't have a vehicle. This, right. He, this is, I this mean, is his life. Get, yeah. Dude. Yeah. And so Dean gave him like a hundred dollar tip or something. <laughs> I'm like, Dean, he, 
What's he gonna do with that? And says, he'll probably roll it up and smoke it. That's what I told him because he he was smoking the <laughs> cigarette. Or, I say cigarette. It smelled like a cigar. It smelled like a cigar. I don't know what he was smoking, but it smelled like a cigar. But when I looked at this thing, and I was like, "Do you mind if I, I take a picture?" And he's like, "Oh, you know." I was like, "I'm saying I'm taking. I do it either way. I'm taking a picture of you because you're just you're just unique." And uh, but he rolled this. It looked like newspaper or like something from a book, like just paper. He rolled it himself, you know. Yeah. And so I don't know if he's got like back tobacco grown out there somewhere and then he harvested it before the winter and i don't know but he rolls he rolls his own stuff and that's why i told dean i said he's probably gonna take that hundred dollar bill and he's probably gonna smoke it you, <laughs> like what are you doing give a hundred dollar american bill you know you didn't even know what to do with that so yeah <clears throat> but so i guess you gave him some of the meat and everything that that you had Oh yeah, oh sorry, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so yeah, so it would have been with him, and and then some of the locals, because again, there's there's a lot of people there that like, they just don't have much, man. Yeah. Like, like literally, they don't have much. It's it's a third world country, and I mean, it definitely makes you appreciate what you have back home. Yeah. You know, and and man, I don't even want to get all political, but there's a lot of people that think our country sucks, and it's like, people, do you have any clue what other countries are like? Like, you have no clue, man. Yeah. Like we have it amazing in America, um, so yeah, it's uh, again, it's it's all part of the experience, and it, it it's there's so much involved in it, not just not just the fact, and 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 that's something else too. Like hundreds of dollars are coming into these these poverty stricken areas, and it's like you realize how many tens of thousands of dollars this hunt's going for, and this money is being dispersed amongst these people. Like this is helping their economy. Right. Like hunters are bringing in big amounts of money to these people and sharing this with these people. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not like we're just a bunch of rednecks that drink beer and kill crap. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah, we're, we're supporting so an economy hunter. in that sense. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like, I mean, and you see it too with, and you know this, I mean, with, with Africa, like people that go to Africa and hunt, that's on my bucket list too. Oh, there's a bunch of animals I want to kill over there. Obviously the African lion. Um, but the amount of money that that generates for those locals. Yeah. And then obviously the meat gets donated. So the, the red tape, you know, to bring a lot of that meat back from whenever you're dealing with international stuff. And now if you're going to Alaska, it's a lot easier to bring obviously meat back because you're in the U.S. It's, you know, you shoot a moose in Alaska, there's there's no red tape to jump through because right. you're going right back to the States. But whenever you're transporting meat, because they're worried about diseases and all kinds of stuff like that, there's so much red tape that you've got to jump through or, or hoops. And then you can't even bring that much back. It's like, it's not even worth it. So I, when I was in New Zealand, um, I forgot how much, I want to say it was like 50 pounds tops, I think. Um, don't don't hold me to that. Don't quote me on that. But I, I just remember thinking, because I'm like, man, I want to bring this back home. Like, this would be cool. Like, I want to share this with my family. Like, we've never had Red Stag, you know. Or And now I end up having Red Stag, obviously, when I was there. But my family has. I'm like, I want to share this with them. And my boys, I want them to have some of the Red Stag that I shot and the fallow deer and um, and so I was like, and of course, then the outfitter is like, well, you can only take this much back, and then you've got to fill out paperwork, and you've got to pay some money, and it's like, oh crap, well, it's, it's not even worth it then, yeah. you know? So then what happens is you just donate it to the local people, you know? Um, so there's a lot of these people that are that are benefiting not just financially, but even just just sustenance, you know, just the food itself. Yeah. Um, and and that's and there's and maybe and maybe we as hunters too maybe do, need to do a better job of telling the story. Um, of those situations, I guess. Because, um, yeah, there's a lot of people that don't know that that's what's happening with it. It's not like we're just rednecks just going out and killing crap, you know, and drinking beer. Uh, right. Although they did like their vodka. They did like their vodka. <laughs> yeah, I imagine so. <laughs> but, uh, Classic. Oh, my goodness. That's, we ain't got time. We dude, we could go for another hour probably. Oh, my goodness. There's so much to unpack. So much to unpack. <clears throat> well, man, you, you've told – you tell the story very, very well. And – uh you know, it's it, it's been awesome to to talk to you about it and to just see, just hear on the video your excitement. You know, reliving it yet again, as I'm sure you already have done a hundred times. You know, since since you've been back. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's it, it, there's there's something special about these kind of experiences, man. And and you had one heck of one. That's there's no doubt about that. Yep. So when are you going? When are you going? I don't know. It, it might be a little sooner than it was before we started talking a couple hours ago. You know. So no, I uh, you 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 got me intrigued for sure. I'll have to think about it <laughs> and then start working on the wife. We'll, well at we'll some start point. Tonight. So whenever I go back, there's there's a good chance I may take a group of guys back with me. Yeah. Um, and that's why I told my wife. I said, you know, because I I got a lot of messages, you know, just through Instagram and. 
And guys tell me like, oh man, I'd love to do that someday, but I'll probably never will. And I'm like, why are you selling yourself? Like I'm, I'm disheartened by these messages because I'm like, why are you selling yourself short? Why do you, why are you saying that you probably never will? Like if, you know, and I had a teacher when I was in school, they, and they, this is a quote, and it's, it may probably stole a quote from somebody else, but they've told me, and you maybe have heard it. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're probably right. That's yeah, that's true. Like, I like that. If you think you can, you're probably right. If you think you can't, you're probably right. Yeah. Like the only limitations we have are the limitations we put on ourselves. And I, I just I get these and so I get these messages and I was telling my wife, I said, you know what, I need to do something. Like I need to I need to start letting these guys know that it's possible. Like even if I need to like set up like a group hunt and say, listen, who you know, and start small, start with because there's a lot of whitetail hunters that that have never been in the mountains and never gone on an elk hunt, you know, done the whole packing in and done that, you know, whatever. And so maybe just start with something like that. Like, listen, how many of you have not been on an elk hunt yet where you pack in and do that whole deal? Is that something you want to do? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh man, yeah, I want to do it. I'll probably do. Okay, let's do it. Yeah. And I'm gonna go with like I'm taking you with me. Like let's just go. No, that, like and so that's, that's why awesome. I told her I said I need to like maybe start doing some of these. That that's awesome, man. Yeah, I so, I agree. I this this year actually, um, I'm hoping to get to do just that the the backcountry elk hunt. I've never elk hunted before, yeah. and again, one of those yeah. one of those deals where you set your mind to it and you decide that you're going to do it. And yeah. I, I find out here actually in a couple of weeks, if I, if I got my tag or not. So, um, fingers well, and, crossed, and but... if you don't draw, there's plenty of over the counter tags that I know, you can get yeah. in different areas. And, and like don't, you know what I'm saying? Just because you don't draw like, well, I didn't draw my tag, so I guess I can't go. No, just, just get and go, man. Like you're going to find out the first year anyways, is going to be pretty much a scouting trip. Yeah. <laughs> the chances of having, unless you go with an outfitter and pay the money, but for the most part, if you're going on your own to do it yourself deal, the first year is pretty much going to be a scouting trip. It's just going to be learning the area. The success rate is going to be extremely low. So not to say you can't get lucky, but for the most part, it's a, it's going to be a scouting trip, and you're going to figure out where the elk are and where the elk aren't. Right. And then so that way when you go next year, you have a better idea. It's like, okay, we know which canyon to go to, and we'll just start right there when we get there. Um, but st- and again, and again, I got these memories logged. Like I'll never forget another moment. I won't forget is the first night I sat in a tent. And again, this is a t- this is a trip that I'd always talked about. Man, I- I'd love to do one of them trips where I go because I'm from Kansas, you know. So I'm not, I don't live in the mountains, but like man, I'd love to go where I pack back in the mountains and sleep in the tent and do the whole deal, you know. And I'll never forget the first time that I was sleeping in a tent that first night. And it was me and a cameraman, and we're sitting there and we're like, dude, we're doing it. We're doing. We're like a couple school <laughs> girls, just like giggling. It's like, dude, we're here, you know. And we're just sleeping in the tent with the stars above us. It's like, here we are. We're packed back in, you know, two, three, six. I don't know how far we were. We went and we had to pack back out. We packed back in several different times in different areas. But uh, just trying to find out. Like I said, it's it's going to be a learning curve the first trip. Yeah. Um, but just that first night, it's like, dude, we're doing it. We're actually doing it. Like, this is the thing we've talked about. And now here we are actually doing it. And that in and of itself is empowering. And it's like, dude, there's there's nothing I can't do. Like, set set your mind on something and go for it. And once you find out that you can actually do it, again, it's it's about finding those limits. You'll start to realize, you start to wonder, do I even have any limits? Like, dude, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've done. And the more you start putting under your belt, it's like, well, how far can I go? Like, I don't, I don't think there's, I don't think there's anything I can't do. Yeah. It's it's empowering. It's really. Empowering empowering and you've you just got to push those limits man you do it i don't care if you draw a tag or not i'm gonna hold you to it i'm gonna send you a message here and what is it i'm gonna send you a message here in a couple months i'm like so where are you going where are you going i don't care if you drew a tag or not where are you going fair enough you gotta go you gotta do it fair enough (laughs) well brett you're you're inspiring man and i i really appreciate you coming on our show and sharing this incredible story and then uh going the extra mile too and and inspiring others and everything it's been awesome well thanks for having me man i I appreciate it thank you absolutely uh real quick uh just as we wrap up the podcast itself tell folks where they can find you oh yeah um so backcountry bow hunter is my personal instagram account you just look up backcountry bow hunter all one word um and then the clothing line is goat gear 
And the the tag for that, I guess the handle for that for Instagram is Goat Gear Outdoors. And you can find the clothing line on there. And the website is GoatGearOutdoors.com. Awesome. Well, guys, go check out everything that Brett's got going on and follow along the the content, the photos, and everything that we that I've seen so far from the bear hunt itself, like we've talked about here tonight. Um, incredible, incredible content. You do a great job with that stuff, man. And, uh, yeah, go check out everything he's got going on. Follow along with the journey. Be sure that you're following Fall Obsession as well on all of our uh, major social media platforms. Subscribe to the podcast. And with that, we're signing off for this episode, and I'll be back with you guys again next week for another podcast. Catch you then.